Once more it was dark when Hugo Bernard stopped work on the walls and ordered the lines of exhausted prisoners down into the courtyard. As Hal passed his father's cell on the way down the staircase, he called desperately to him, Father, can you hear me? When there was no reply, he hammered on the door with both his fists. Father, speak to me in the name of God, speak to me! For once, Mansier was indulgent. He made no attempt to force Hal to move on down the staircase, and Hal pleaded again, Please, father! It's Hal, your son! Do you not know me? Hal, croaked a voice he did not recognise. Is that you, my boy? Oh, God! Hal sank to his knees and pressed his forehead to the panel. Yes, father, it is me. Be strong. My son, it will not be for much longer. But I charge you, if you love me, then keep the oath. I cannot let you suffer. I cannot let this go on. How? His father's voice was suddenly powerful again. There is no more suffering. I have passed that point. They cannot hurt me now, except... Through you. What can I do to ease you? Tell me what can I do, Hal pleaded. There is only one thing you can do now. Let me take with me the knowledge of your strength and your fortitude. If you fail me now, it will all have been in vain. Hal bit into the knuckles of his own clenched fist, drawing blood in the vain attempt to stifle his sobs. His father's voice came again. Daniel, are you there? Aye, Captain. Help him. Help my son to be a man. I give you my promise, Captain. Hal raised his head and his voice was stronger. I do not need anybody to help me. I will keep my faith with you, father. I will not betray your trust. Farewell, Hal. Sir Francis's voice began to fade, as though he were falling into an infinite pit. You are my blood and my promise of eternal life. Goodbye, my life. The following morning, when they carried Sir Francis up from the dungeon, Hop and Dr. Saar walked on either side of the litter. They were both worried men, for there was no sign of life in the broken figure that lay between them. Even when Hal defied Bernard's whip and called down to him from the walls, Sir Francis did not raise his head. They took him down the stairs to where Slow John already waited, but within a few minutes all three came out into the sunlight, Saar, Hop and Stade de Chayan and stood talking quietly for a short while. Then they walked together across to the governor's suite and mounted the stairs. Van der Felder was standing by the stained-glass window peering out at the shipping that lay anchored off the foreshore. Late the previous evening, another company galleon had come into Table Bay, and he was expecting the ship's captain to call upon him to pay his respects and to present an order for provisions and stores. Van der Felder turned impatiently from the window to face the three men as they filed into his chamber. Ya yeah, hop! He looked at his favourite victim. You have remembered my orders for once, hey? You have brought the state executioner to speak to me? He turned to Slow John. So, has the pirate told you where he has hidden the treasure? Come on, fellow, speak up! Slow John's expression did not change as he said softly, I have worked carefully not to damage the respondent beyond usefulness. But I am nearing the end. Soon he will no longer hear my voice, nor be sensible to any further persuasion. You have failed? Van der Felder's voice trembled with anger. No, not yet, said Slow John. He is strong. I would never have believed how strong. But there is still the wreck. I do not believe that he will be able to withstand the rack. No man can weather the rack. You have not used it yet, Van der Felder demanded. Why not? To me it is the last resort. Once they have been wrecked, there is nothing left. It is the end. 
Will it work with this one? Thunderfelder wanted to know. What happens if he still resists? Then there is only the scaffold and the gibbet, said Stadachian. Slowly, Thunderfelder turned to Dr. Saar. What is your opinion, doctor? Your Excellency, if you require an execution, then it should be carried out very soon after the man is wrecked. How soon? Thunderfelder demanded. Today, before nightfall. After wrecking, he will not last the night. Thunderfelder turned back to Slow John. You have disappointed me. I am displeased. Slow John did not seem to hear the rebuke. His eyes did not even flicker as he stared back at Thunderfelder. However, we must do what we can to make the best of this whole sorry business. I will order the execution for three o'clock this afternoon. In the meantime, you are to go back and place the pirate on the wreck. I understand, Your Excellency, said Stadachian. You have failed me once. Do not do so again. He must be alive when he goes to the scaffold. Van der Felder turned to the clerk. Hop! Send messengers through the town. I am declaring the rest of today to be a holiday throughout the colony, except for the work on the castle walls, of course. Francis Courtney will be executed at three o'clock this afternoon. Every burger in the colony must be there. I want all to see how we deal with the pirate. Oh, and by the way, make certain that Mifro van der Felder is informed. She will be very angry if she misses the sport. At two o'clock they brought Sir Francis Courtney on a litter from the cell below the armory. They had not bothered to cover his naked body, even from high up on the south wall of the castle, and with his vision blurred by his tears, Howell could see that his father's body had been grotesquely deformed by the rack. Every one of his great joints in his limbs and at his shoulders and pelvis were dislocated, swollen, and bruised purple-black. An execution detail of green jackets was drawn up in the courtyard. Led by an officer with a drawn sword, they fell in around the litter. Twenty men marched in front, and twenty followed behind, their muskets at the slope. The tap-tap-tap-tap of the death drum set the pace. The procession snaked through the castle gates out onto the parade. Daniel placed his arm around Hal's shoulder as the boy watched, white-faced and shivering in the icy wind. Hal made no move to pull away from him. Those seamen who had coverings for their heads removed them, unwinding the filthy rags and standing grim and silent as the beer passed beneath them. "'God bless you, Captain,' Ned Tyler called out. You were as good a man as ever hoisted a sail. There was a hoarse and ragged cheer from the others, and one of Hugo Bernard's huge black hounds bayed mournfully, a strangely harrowing sound. Out on the parade, the crowd waited around the gibbet in tense and expectant silence. Every living soul in the colony seemed to have answered the summons. Above their heads, Stadachian waited high on the platform. He wore his leather apron, and his head was covered with the mask of his office the mask of death. His eyes and his mouth were all that showed through the slits in the black cloth. Led by the drummer, the procession marched with slow and measured tread towards him, and Slow John waited with his arms folded over his chest. Even he turned his head as the governor's carriage came down the avenue through the gardens and crossed the parade. Slow John bowed to the governor and his wife, as Aberley guided the six grey horses to the foot of the scaffold, and brought the vehicle to a halt. Slowly, Slow John's yellow eyes met those of Katinka through the slits in his black headcloth. He bowed again, this time to her directly. She knew, without words being spoken, that he was dedicating the sacrifice to her, to his goddess Kali. He has no reason to act so grand. The oaf has made the botch of the job so far. Thunderfelder said grumpily. He has killed a man without getting a word out of him. I don't know what your father and the other members of the Seventeen are going to say when they hear that the cargo is lost. They are going to blame me, of course. They always do. As always, you will have me to protect you, my darling husband, she said, and stood up in the carriage to have a better view. The escort stopped at the foot of the gallows, and the litter with the tall, still figure upon it was lifted high and placed at Slow John's feet. A low growl went up from the watchers as the executioner knelt beside it to begin his grisly task. 
A little later, when the crowd gave forth a lusty roar, made up of excitement and horror and obscene glee, the grey horses shied and fidgeted nervously in the traces at the sound and smell of fresh human blood. With an impassive face and gentle hands on the reins, Aberley checked them and brought them back under control. Slowly, he turned away his head from the dreadful spectacle taking place before his eyes and looked towards the unfinished walls of the castle. He recognised the figure of Hal among the other convicts. He stood almost as tall as Big Daniel now, and he had the shape and set of a fully mature man. But he has a boy's heart still. He should not look upon this thing. No man or boy should ever have to watch his father die. Abilie's own great heart felt that it might burst in the barrel of his chest. But his face was still impassive beneath the cicatrice of tattoos. He looked back at the scaffold as Sir Francis Courtney's body rose slowly in the air and the crowd bellowed again. Slow John's pressure on the rope was gentle and sure as he lifted Sir Francis from the litter by his neck. It required a delicate touch not to snap the vertebra and end it all too soon. It was a matter of pride to him that the last spark of life must not be snuffed out of that broken husk until after the drawing out of the viscera. Firmly, Abberley turned away his eyes and looked again to the bereft and tragic figure of Hal Courtney on the castle walls. We should not mourn him, Gundwani. He was a man, and he lived the life of a man. He sailed every ocean and fought as a warrior must fight, he knew the stars and the ways of men. He called no man master and turned aside from no enemy. No, Gundwani, we should not mourn him, you and I. He will never die while he lives in our hearts. For four days, Sir Francis Courtney's dismembered body remained on public display. Every morning, as the light strengthened, Hal looked down from the walls and saw it still hanging there. The gals came from the beach in a shrieking cloud of black and white wings and squabbled raucously over the feast. When they had gorged, they perched on the railing of the gibbet and whitewashed the planks with their liquid dung. For once, Hal hated the clarity of his own eyesight that spared him no detail of the terrible transformation that was taking place as he watched by the third day, the birds had picked the flesh from his father's skull so that it grinned at the sky with empty eye sockets. The burghers, crossing the open parade on their way to the castle, walked well downwind of the scaffolding on which he hung, and the ladies held sachets of dried herbs to their faces as they passed. However, on the dawning of the fifth day, when Hal looked down upon it, the gibbet was empty. His father's pathetic remains no longer hung there, and the seagulls had gone back to the beach. Thank the merciful Lord, Ned Tyler whispered to Daniel. Now young Hal can begin to heal. Yet it is a strange thing that they have taken the corpse away so soon. Daniel was puzzled. I could not have thought that Thunderfelder could be so compassionate. Sukina had showed him how to slip the grating on one of the small back windows of the slave quarters and squeeze his great body through. The night guard at the residence had become lax over the years, and Abberley had little difficulty in evading the watch. For three consecutive nights he escaped from the slave quarters. Sukina had warned him that he must return at least two hours before dawn, for at that hour the watch would rouse themselves and put on a show of vigilance to impress the awakening household. Once he had escaped over the walls, it took Abberley less than an hour to run through the darkness to the boundary of the colony, marked by a hedge of bitter almond bushes, planted at the order of the governor. Although the hedge was still scraggy and there were more gaps than barriers in its length, it was the line over which no burgher might pass without the governor's permission. On the other hand, none of the scattered Hottentot tribes that inhabited the limitless wilderness of the plain, mountain and forest beyond were allowed to cross the hedge and enter the colony. On the orders of the company, they were to be shot or hanged if they transgressed the boundary. The VOC was no longer prepared to tolerate the savages' treachery their sly, thieving ways, or their drunkenness, when they were able to get their hands on spirits. The wanton whoring of their women, 
who would lift their short leather skirts for a handful of beads or a trifling trinket, was a threat to the morals of the God-fearing burghers of the colony. Selected tribesmen, who might be useful as soldiers and servants, were allowed to remain in the colony, but the rest had been driven out into the wilderness where they belonged. Each night Aberley crossed this makeshift boundary and ranged like a silent black ghost across the flat plain whose wide expanses cut off Table Mountain and its bastion of lesser hills from the main ranges of the African hinterland. The wild animals had not been driven off these plains, for few white hunters had been allowed to leave the confines of the colony to pursue them. Here Aberley heard again the wild, heart-stopping chorus of a pride of hunting lions that he remembered from his childhood. The leopard soared and coughed in the thickets, and often he startled unseen herds of antelope whose hooves drummed through the night. Aberley needed a black bull. Twice he'd been so close as to smell the buffalo herd in the thickets. The scent reminded him of his father's herds of cattle, which he had tended in his childhood before his circumcision. He had heard the grunting of the great beasts and the lowing of the weaning calves. He had followed their deeply ploughed hoof marks and seen splashes on their wet dung still steaming in the moonlight. But each time as he closed with the herd, the wind had tricked him. They had sensed him and gone crashing away through the brush, galloping on until the sound of their flight dwindled into silence. Aberley could pursue them no further, for it was past midnight and he was still hours away from the bitter almond hedge and from his cell in the slave quarters. On the third night he took the chance of creeping out of the window of the slave quarters an hour earlier than Sukina had warned him was wise. One of the hounds rushed at him, but before it could alarm the watch, Aberley calmed it with a soft whistle. The hound recognised him and snuffled his hand. He stroked its head and whispered softly to it in the language of the forests, and left it whining softly and wagging its tail as he slipped over the wall like a dark moon shadow. During his previous hunts, he had discovered that each night the buffalo herd left the fastness of the dense forest to drink at a waterhole a mile or so beyond the boundary hedge. He knew that if he crossed it before midnight, he might be able to catch them while they were still at the water. It was his best chance of being able to pick out a bull and make his stalk. From the hollow tree at the edge of the forest, he retrieved the bow that he had cut and carved from a branch of wild olive. Sukina had stolen the single iron arrowhead from the collection of weapons that Governor Kleinhans had assembled during his service in the Indies, which now hung on the walls of the residence. It was unlikely that it would be missed from among the dozens of swords, shields and knives that made up the display. I will return it to you, he promised Sukina. I would not have you suffer if it should be missed. Your need of it is greater than my risk, she told him, as she slipped the arrowhead wrapped in a scrap of cloth beneath the seat of the carriage. I also had a father who was denied a decent burial. Aberley had fitted the arrowhead to a reed shaft and bound it in place with twine and pitch. He had fletched it with the molted feathers from the hunting falcons housed in the mews behind the stables. However, he did not have time to search for the insect grubs from which to brew poison for the barbs, and so he must rely on this single shaft flying true to the mark. Now, as Aberley hunted in the shadows, himself another silent gliding shadow, he found old forgotten skills returning to him, and recalled the instruction that he had undergone as a young boy from the elders of his tribe. He felt the night wind softly caress his bare chest and flanks, and was aware of its direction at all times as he circled the waterhole until it blew straight into his face. It brought down to him the rich bovine stench of the prey he sought. The wind was strong enough to shake the tall reeds and cover any sound he might make, so he could move in swiftly over the last hundred paces. Above the soughing of the north wind and the rustle of the reeds, he heard a coughing grunt. He froze and knocked his single arrow. Had the lions come to the water ahead of the herd, he wondered, for that had been a leonine sound. He stared ahead and heard the sound of great hoofs plodding and sucking in the mud of the waterhole. Above the rippling heads of the reeds, a dark shape moved, mountainous in the moonlight. A bull, he breathed. A bull of a bull.
The bull had finished drinking. The crafty old beast had come ahead of the cows and calves of the breeding herd. His back was coated with glistening wet mud from the wallow, and he plodded towards where Aberley crouched, his hoofs squelching in the mud. Aberley lost sight of the prey as he sank down among the swaying stems and let him come on, but he could mark him by the sound of the heavy breathing and by the rasping of the reeds dragging down his flanks. The bull was very close, but still out of Aberley's sight, when suddenly he shook his head as the reed stems tangled in his horns and his ears flapped against his cheeks. If I reach out now, I could touch his snout, Aberley thought. Every nerve in his body was drawn as tight as the bowstring in his fingers. The reed bank parted in front of Aberley, and the massive head came through, the moonlight gleaming on the curved bosses of the horns. Abruptly the bull became aware of something amiss, of danger lurking close at hand, and he stopped and raised his huge black head. As he lifted his muzzle to test the air, his nose was wet and shining, and water drooled from his mouth. He flared his nostrils into dark pits and snuffled the air. Aberley could feel his breath hot upon his naked chest and his face. The bull turned his head, questing for the scent of man or cat, for the hidden hunter. Aberley stayed still as a tree stump. He was holding the heavy bow at full draw. The power of the olive branch and the gut bowstring was so fierce that even the granite muscles in his arms and shoulder bulged and trembled with the effort. As the bull turned his head, he revealed the notch behind his ear, where the neck fused with the bone of his skull and the massive boss of his horns. Aberley held his aim for one heartbeat longer, then loosed the arrow. It flashed and whirred in the moonlight, leaping from his hand and burying half its length in the massive black neck. The bull reeled back. If the arrowhead had found the gap between the vertebra of the spine, as Aberley had hoped, he would have dropped where he stood, but the iron point struck the spine and was deflected by the bone. It glanced aside, but sliced through the great artery behind the jawbone. As the bull bucked and kicked to the stinging impact of the steel, the severed artery erupted and a spout of blood flew high in the air, black as an ostrich feather in the light of the moon. The bull dashed past Aberley, hooking wildly with those wide curved horns. If Aberley had not dropped his bow and hurled himself aside, the burnished point that hissed by, a finger's width from his navel, would have skewered him and ripped open his bowels. The bull charged on and reached the hard, dry ground. On his knees, Aberley strained his ears to follow his quarry's crashing rush through the scrub. Abruptly, it came up short. There was a long, fraught pause in which he could hear the animal's laboured breathing and the patter of streaming blood falling on the leaves of the low bushes around it. Then he heard the bull stagger and stumble backwards, trying to remain on his feet while the strength flowed out of his huge body on that tide of dark blood. The beast fell heavily, so as the earth trembled under Aberley's bare feet. A moment later came the rasping death bellow, and thereafter an aching quietness. Even the night birds and the bullfrogs of the swamp had been silenced by that dreadful sound. It was as though all the forest held its breath at the passing of such a mighty creature. Then, slowly, the night came alive once again. The frogs piped and croaked from the reed beds. A night jaw screeched, and from afar an eagle owl hooted mournfully. Abelie skinned the bull with the knife that Sukina had stolen for him from the residence kitchens. He folded the green skin and tied it with bark rope. It was heavy enough to tax even his strength. He staggered with the bundle until he could get under it and balance it on his head. He left the naked carcass for the packs of night-prowling hyena and the flocks of vultures, carnivorous storks, kites and crows that would find it with the first light of morning and set off back towards the colony and the tabletop mountain silhouetted against the stars. Even under his burden he moved at the ground-eating trot of the warriors of his tribe that was becoming so natural to him again after his confinement for two decades in a small ship upon the seas. He was remembering so much long-forgotten tribal lore and wisdom, relearning old skills, becoming once more a true son of this baked African earth. He climbed to the lower slopes of the mountain and left the bundled skin in a narrow crevice in the rock cliff. 
He covered it with large boulders, for the hyenas roamed here also, attracted by the rubbish and wastes and sewage generated by the human settlement of the colony. When he had placed the last boulder, he looked up at the sky and saw that the curling scorpion was falling fast towards the dark horizon. Only then he realised how swiftly the night had sped and went bounding back across the slope. He reached the edge of the company gardens just as the first rooster crowed in the darkness. Later that morning, as he waited on the bench with the other slaves outside the kitchens for his breakfast bowl of gruel and thick curdled sour milk, Sukina passed on her way to tend the affairs of the household. I heard you return last night. You are out too late, she whispered, without turning her head on the orchid stem of her neck. If you are discovered, you will bring great hardship on all of us, and our plans will come to naught. My task is almost finished, he rumbled softly. Tonight will be the last time I need to go out. Have a care, Emily. There is much at risk, she said, and glided away. Despite her warning, she had given him any help he had asked for, and without watching her go, Abberley whispered to himself, That little one has the heart of a lioness. That night, when the house had settled down for the night, he slipped through the grating. Again, the dogs were stilled by his quiet whistle, and he had lumps of dried sausage for each of them. When he reached the wall below the lawns, he looked to the stars and saw in the eastern sky the first soft luminescence of the moonrise. He vaulted over it, and keeping well clear of the road, guided himself by touch along the outside of the wall towards the settlement. No more than three or four dim lights were showing from the cottages and buildings of the village. The four ships at anchor in the bay were all burning lanterns at their mastheads. The castle was a dark, brooding shape against the starlight. He waited at the edge of the parade and tuned his ears to the sounds of the night. Once, as he was about to set out across the open ground, he heard drunken laughter and snatches of singing as a party of soldiers from the castle returned from an evening of debauchery among the rude hovels on the waterfront, which passed as taverns in this remote station, selling the rough, raw spirit the Hottentots called Dop. One of the revellers carried a tar-dipped torch. The flames wove uncertainly as the man stopped before the gibbet in the middle of the parade and shouted an insult at the corpse that still hung upon it. His companions bellowed with drunken laughter at his humour and then reeled on, supporting each other towards the castle. When they had disappeared through the gates, and when silence and darkness fell, Abberley moved out swiftly across the parade. Though he could not see more than a few paces ahead, the smell of corruption guided him, only a dead lion smells as strongly as a rotting human corpse. Sir Francis Courtney's body had been beheaded and neatly quartered. Stardacher Jan had used a butcher's cleaver to hack through the larger bones. Abberley brought down the head from the spike on which it had been impaled. He wrapped it in a clean white cloth and placed it in the saddlebag he carried. Then he retrieved the other parts of the corpse. The dogs from the village had carried off some of the smaller bones. But even working in darkness, Abberley was able to recover what remained. He closed and buckled the leather flap of the bag, slung it over his shoulder, and set off again at a run towards the mountain. Sukina knew the mountain intimately, every ravine, cliff and crag. She had explained to him how to find the narrow, concealed entrance to the cavern, where the previous night he had left the raw buffalo skin. In the light of the rising moon, he returned unerringly to it. When he reached the entrance, he stooped and swiftly removed the boulders that covered the buffalo skin. Then he crawled further into the crevice and drew aside the bushes that hung down from the cliff above to conceal the dark throat of the cavern. He worked deftly with flint and steel to light one of the candles Sukina had provided. Shielding the flame with cupped hands from any watcher below the mountain, he went forward and crawled into the low natural tunnel on hands and knees, dragging the saddlebag behind him. As Sukina had told him, the tunnel opened suddenly into a cavern high enough for him to stand. He held the candle above his head and saw that the cavern would make a fitting burial place for a great chief. There was even a natural rock shelf at the far end. He left the saddlebag upon it, and crawled back to retrieve the buffalo skin. Before he entered the tunnel again, he looked back over his shoulder and reoriented himself in the direction of the moonrise. 
I shall turn his face to greet ten thousand moons and all the sunrises of eternity, he said softly, and dragged the heavy skin into the cavern and spread it on the rock floor. He placed the candle on the rock shelf and began to unpack the bag. First he set aside those small offerings and ceremonial items he had brought with him. Then he lifted out Sir Francis's covered head and laid it in the centre of the buffalo hide. He unwrapped it reverently and showed no repugnance for the thick, clawing odour of decay that slowly filled the cavern. He assembled all the other dismembered parts of the body and arranged them in their natural order, binding them in place with slim strands of bark rope, until Sir Francis lay on his side, his knees drawn up beneath his chin and his arms hugging his legs, the fetal position of the womb and of sleep. Then he folded the wet buffalo hide tightly around him, so that only his ravaged face was still exposed. He stitched the folds of the hide around him, so that they would dry into an iron-hard sarcophagus. It was a long and meticulous task, and when the candle burnt down and guttered in a pool of its own liquid wax, he lit another from the stump and worked on. When he had finished, he took up the turtle-shell comb, another of Sukina's gifts, and combed out the tangled tresses that still adhered to Sir Francis's skull and braided them neatly. At last he lifted the seated body and placed it on the stone shelf. He turned it carefully to face the east, to gaze forever towards the moonrise and the dawn. For a long while he squatted below the ledge and looked upon the ravaged head, seeing it in his mind's eye as it once was, the face of the vigorous young mariner who had rescued him from the slaver's hold two decades before. At last he rose and began to gather up the grave goods he had brought with him. He laid them one at a time on the ledge before the body of Sir Francis, the tiny model of a ship he had carved with his own hands. There had not been time to lavish care upon its construction, and it was crude and childlike. However, the three masts had sails set upon them, and the name carved into the stern was Lady Edwina. May this ship carry you over the dark oceans to the landfall where the woman whose name she bears awaits you, Abberley whispered. Next, he placed the knife and the bow of olive wood beside the ship. I have no sword with which to arm you, but may these weapons be your defence in the dark places. Then he offered the food bowl and the water bottle. May you never again hunger or thirst. Lastly, the cross of wood that Abberley had fashioned and decorated with green abalone shell white carved bone and small bright stones from the riverbed. May the cross of your God, which guided you in life, guide you still in death, he said, as he placed the cross before Sir Francis's empty eyes. Kneeling on the cavern floor, he built a small fire and lit it from the candle. May this fire warm you in the darkness of your long night. Then, in his own language, he sang the funeral chant and the song of the traveller on a long journey, clapping his hands softly to keep time and to show respect. When the flames of the fire burned low, he stood and moved to the entrance of the cavern. Farewell, my friend, he said. Goodbye, my father. Governor van der Felder was a cautious man, at first, he had not allowed Abberley to drive him in the carriage. This is a whim of yours that I will not deny, my dear, he told his wife. But the fellow is a black savage. What does he know of horses? He is really very good, better by far than old Fredericus, Katinka laughed. And he looks so splendid in the new livery I have designed for him. His fancy maroon coat and breeches will be of little interest to me when he breaks my neck, Thunderfelder said. But despite his misgivings, he watched the way Abberley handled the team of greys. The first morning that Abberley drove the governor down from the residence to his suite in the castle, there was a stir and a murmur among the convicts working on the walls as the carriage crossed the parade and approached the castle gates. They had recognised Abberley sitting high on the coachman's seat with the long whip in his white-gloved hands. Howell was on the point of shouting a greeting to him, but checked himself in time, it was not the sting of Bernard's whip that dissuaded him, but he realised that it would be unwise to remind his captors that Abberley had been his shipmate. 
The Dutch would expect him to regard a black man as a slave and not as a companion. Nobody greet Abberley, he whispered urgently to Daniel, sweating beside him. Ignore him. Pass it on. The order went swiftly down the ranks of men on the scaffold and then to those labouring in the courtyard. When the carriage came in through the gates to a turnout of the honour guard and the salutes of the garrison's officers, none of the convicts paid any attention. They devoted themselves to the heavy work with block and tackle and iron bar. Abberley sat like a carved figurehead on the coachman's seat, staring directly ahead. His dark eyes did not even flicker in Hal's direction. He drew the team of greys to a halt at the foot of the staircase and sprang down to lower the folding steps and hand out the governor. Once von der Felder had waddled up the stairs and disappeared into his suite, Abberley returned to his seat and sat upon it unmoving, facing straight ahead. In a short time the jailers and guards forgot his silent presence, turned their attention to their duties, and the castle fell into its routine. An hour passed, and one of the horses threw its head and fidgeted. From the corner of his eye, Hal had noticed Abberley touch the reins to agitate the animal slightly. Now he climbed unhurriedly down and went to its head. He held its leather cheek strap and stroked its head and murmured endearments to it. The grey quieted immediately under his touch, and Abberley went down on one knee and lifted first one front foot and then the other, examining the hoofs for any injury. Still on one knee, and screened by the horse's body from the view of any of the guards or overseers, he looked up for the first time at Hal. Their gaze touched for an instant. Abberley nodded almost imperceptibly, and opened his right fist to give Hal a glimpse of the tiny curl of white paper he had in his palm, then closed his fist and stood up. He walked down the team of horses, examining each animal and making minute adjustments to the harness. At last he turned aside and leaned against the stone wall beside him, stooping to wipe the fine flowering of dust from his boots. Hal watched him take the quill of paper and surreptitiously stuff it into a joint in the stonework of the wall. He straightened and returned to the coachman's seat to await the governor's pleasure. Van der Felder never showed consideration for servant, slave, or animal. All that morning the team of greys stood patiently in the traces, with Abberley soothing them at intervals. A little before noon the governor re-emerged from the company officers and had himself driven back to the residence for the midday meal. In the dusk, as the convicts warily climbed down into the courtyard, Hal stumbled as he reached the ground and put out his hand to steady himself. Neatly he picked the scrap of folded paper from the joint in the stonework where Abberley had left it. Once in the dungeon there was just sufficient light filtering down from the torch in its bracket at the top of the staircase for Hal to read the message. It was written in a fine, neat hand that he did not recognise. Despite all his father's and Hal's own instruction, Abberley's handwriting had never been better than large, sprawling and malformed. It seemed that another scribe had framed these words. A tiny nub of charcoal was wrapped in the paper, placed there for Hal to write his reply on the reverse of the scrap. The captain buried with honour. Hal's heart leapt as he read that. So it was Abberley who had taken down his father's mutilated corpse from the gibbet. I should have known he would give my father that respect. Continuing with Birds of Prey by Wilbur Smith. There was only one more word written on the paper. Alsuda, with a question mark. Howell puzzled over this until he understood that Abberley, or the writer, must be asking after the welfare of the other prisoner. Alsuda, he called softly. Are you awake? Greetings, Howell. What cheer? Somebody outside asks after you. There was a long silence as Alsuda considered this. Who asks? I know not. Hal could not explain, for he was certain that the jailers eavesdropped on these exchanges. Another long silence. I can guess, Althuda called, and so can you. We have discussed her before. Uh, can you send a reply? Tell her I am alive. Hal rubbed the charcoal on the wall to sharpen a point on it and wrote, Althuda, well. 
even though his letters were small and cramped, there was space for no more on the paper. The following morning, as they were led out to begin the day's work on the scaffold, Daniel screened Howell for the moment he needed to push the scrap of paper into the same crack from which he had retrieved it. In the middle of the morning, Abberley drove the governor down from the residence and parked once more beneath the staircase. Long after van der Felder had disappeared into his sanctum, Abberley remained on the coachman's seat. At last, looked up casually at a flock of red-winged starlings that had come down from the cliffs to perch on the walls of the eastern bastion and give vent to their low, mournful whistles. From the birds, his eye passed over Howell, who nodded. Once again, Abberley dismounted and tended his horses, pausing beside the wall to adjust the straps on his boots and with a magician's sleight of hand to recover the message from the crack in the wall. Howell breathed easier when he saw it, for they had established their letterbox. They did not make the mistake of trying to exchange messages every day. Sometimes a week or more might pass before Abberley nodded at Hal and placed a note in the wall. If Hal had a message, he would give the same signal and Abberley would leave paper and charcoal for him. The second message Hal received was in that artistic and delicate script. A is safe. Orchid sends her heart. Is the orchid the one we spoke of? Hal called to Althuda that night. She sends you her heart and says you are safe. I do not know how she has achieved that, but I must believe it and be thankful to her. In this, as in so many things, there was a lift of relief in Althuda's tone. Hal held the scrap of paper to his nose and fancied that he detected the faintest perfume upon it. He huddled on his damp straw in a corner of the cell. He thought about Sukina until sleep overcame him. The memory of her beauty was like a candle flame in the winter darkness of the dungeon. Governor van der Felder was passing drunk. He had swilled the Rhenish with the soup and Madeira with the fish and the lobster. The red wines of Burgundy had accompanied the mutton stew and the pigeon pie. He had quaffed the claret with the beef and interspersed each with draughts of good Dutch gin. When at last he rose from the board, he steadied himself as he wove to his seat by the fire with a hand on his wife's arm. She was not usually so attentive. But all this evening she had been in an affectionate and merry mood, laughing at his sallies, which on other occasions she would have ignored, and refilling his glass with her own precious hand before it was half emptied. Come to think of it, he could not remember when last they had dined alone, just the two of them, like a pair of lovers. For once he had not been forced to put up with the company of the rustic yokels from the settlement, or with the obsequious flattery of ambitious company servants, or, greatest blessing of all, without the posturing and boasting of that amorous prig Schroeder. He fell back in the deep leather chair beside the fire, and Sukina brought him a box of good Dutch cigars to choose from. As she held the burning taper for him, he peered with a lascivious eye down the front of her costume. The soft swell of girlish breasts, between which nestled the exotic jade brooch, moved him so that he felt his groin swell and engorge pleasantly. Katinka was kneeling at the open hearth, but she regarded him so slyly that he worried for a moment that she had seen him ogle the slave girl's bosom. But then she smiled and took up the poker that was heating in the fire and plunged its glowing tip into the stone jug of scented wine. It boiled and fumed, and she filled a bowl of it and brought it to him before it had time to cool. "'My beautiful wife,' he slurred a little. "'My little darling.' He toasted her with the steaming bowl. He was not yet so intoxicated or gullible that he did not realise there would be some price to pay for this unusual kindness. There always was. Kneeling in front of him, Katinka looked up at Sukina, who hovered close at hand. That is all for tonight, Sukina. You may go. She gave the slave girl a knowing smile. I wish you sweet sleep and dreams of paradise, master and mistress. Sukina gave that graceful genuflection and glided from the room. She slid the carved oriental screen door closed behind her and knelt there quietly with her face close to the panel. These were her mistress's orders. Katinka wanted Sukina to witness what transpired between her and her husband. She knew that it would tighten the knot that bound the slave girl to her. Now Katinka moved behind her husband's chair. 
You have had such a difficult week, she said softly. What with the affair of the pirate's body being stolen from the scaffold, and now the new census and taxation ordinances from the Seventeen. My poor darling husband, let me massage your shoulders for you. She removed his wig and kissed the top of his head. A stubble prickled her lips, and she stood back and dug her thumbs into his heavy shoulders. Van der Felder sighed with pleasure, not only with the sensation of the knots being eased from his muscles, but because he recognized this as the prelude to the infrequent dispensation of her sexual favors. How much do you love me? she asked and leaned over him to nibble at his ear. I adore you, he blurted out. I worship you. You are always so kind to me. Her voice took on that husky quality that made his skin tingle. I want to be kind to you. I have written to my father. I have explained to him the circumstances of the pirate's demise and how it was not your fault that it happened. I shall give the letter to the captain of the homeward-bound galleon which is anchored in the bay at the moment to hand to papa in person. May I see the letter before you dispatch it? He asked warily. It would carry much weight if it could accompany my own report to the Seventeen, which I shall send on the same ship. Of course you may. I shall bring it to you before you leave for the castle in the morning. She brushed the top of his head with her lips again and slid her fingers from his shoulders down over his chest. She unhooked the buttons of his doublet and slipped both hands into the opening. She took a handful of each of his pendulous dugs and kneaded them as though they were lumps of soft bread dough. You are such a good little wife, he said. I would like to give you a sign of my love. What do you lack? A jewel? A pet? A new slave? Tell your old Petrus. I do have a little whimsy, she admitted coyly. There is a man in the dungeons. One of the pirates, she hazarded. No, a slave named Althuda. Oh, yes, I know about him. The rebel runaway. I shall deal with him this coming week. His death warrant is already on my desk waiting for his signature. Shall I give him to Star Khayyan? Would you like to watch? Is that it? You want to enjoy the sport? How can I deny you? She reached down and began to unlace the fastening of his breeches. He spread his legs and lay back comfortably in the chair to make the task easier for her. I want you to grant Alsuda a reprieve, she whispered in his ear. He sat bolt upright. You are mad, she gasped. You are so cruel to call me mad, she pouted. But, but he is a runaway. He and his gang of thugs murdered twenty of the soldiers who were sent to recapture him. I could never free him. I know you cannot release him. But I want you to keep him alive. You could set him to work on the walls of your castle. I cannot do it, he shook his shaven head. Not even for you. She came round from behind his chair and knelt in front of him. Her fingers began work again on the lacing of his breeches. He tried to sit up, but she pushed him back and reached inside. All the saints bear witness the old sodomite makes it difficult for me. He is as soft and white as unrisen dough, she thought as she grasped him. Not even for your own loving wife, she whispered, and looked up with swimming violet eyes as she thought... That's a little better. I felt the drooping lily twitch. I mean, rather, that it would be difficult. He was in a quandary. I understand, she murmured. It was just as difficult for me to compose my letter to my father. I would hate to be forced to burn it. She stood up and lifted her skirts as though she were about to climb over a stile. She was naked from the waist down, and his eyes bulged like those of a cod hauled up abruptly from deep water. He struggled to sit up and at the same time tried to reach for her. I'll not have you on top of me again, you great tub of pork lard, she thought, as she smiled lovingly at him and held him down with both hands on his shoulders. Last time you nearly squashed the life out of me. She straddled him as though she were mounting the mare. Oh, sweet Jesus, what a mighty man you are, she cried as she took him in. 
The only pleasure she received from it was the thought of Sukina listening at the screen door. She closed her eyes and summoned up the image of the slave girl's slim thighs and the treasure that lay between them. The thought inflamed her, and she knew that her husband would feel her flowing response and think it was for him alone. Katinka, he gurgled and snorted as though he were drowning. I love you. De reprieve? she asked. I cannot do it. Then neither can I, she said, and lifted herself onto her knees. She had to fight to keep herself from laughing aloud as she watched his face swell and his eyes bulge further out. He wriggled and heaved under her, thrusting vainly at the air. Please, he whimpered. Please? De reprieve? she asked, keeping herself suspended tantalizingly above him. Yeah, he whinnied. Anything. I will give you anything you want. I love you, my husband, she whispered in his ear and sank down like a bird settling on its nest. Last time he lasted to count one hundred, she remembered. This time I shall try to bring him to the finishing line in under fifty. With rocking hips she set herself to better her own record. Mancia opened the door of Althuda's cell and roared, Come out, you murderous dog! Governor's orders! You go to work on the wall! Althuda stepped out through the iron door and Mancia glared at him. Seems you'll not be dancing a quadrille on the scaffold with Star Khayan, more's the pity. But don't crow too loud, you'll give us as much sport on the castle walls. Bernard and his hounds will see to that. You'll not last the winter out. I'll wager a hundred guilders on it. Hal led the file of convicts up from the lower cells and paused on the stone step below Althuda. For a long moment they studied each other keenly. Both looked pleased at what they saw. If you give me a choice, then I think I prefer the cut of your sister's jib to yours, Hal smiled. Althuda was smaller in stature than his voice had suggested, and all the marks of his long captivity were plain to see. His skin was sallow, and his hair matted and tangled, but the body that showed through the holes in his miserable rags was neat and strong and supple. His gaze was frank, and his countenance comely and open. Although his eyes were almond-shaped, and his hair straight and black, his English blood mingled well with that of his mother's people. There was a proud and stubborn set to his jaw. "'What cradle did you fall out of?' he asked Hal with a grin. It was obvious that he was overjoyed to come out from the shadow of the gallows. I called for a man and they sent a boy. Come on, you murdering renegade, Bernard bellowed as the jailer handed over the convicts to his charge. You may have escaped the noose for the moment, but I have a few pleasures in store for you. You slit the throats of some of my comrades on the mountainside. It was clear that all the garrison bitterly resented Althuda's reprieve. Then Bernard turned on Hal. As for you, you stinking pirate, your tongue is too loose by far. One word out of you today and I'll kick you off the wall and feed the scraps to my dogs. Bernard separated the two of them. He sent Hal back onto the scaffold and set Alsuda to work in the gangs of convicts down in the courtyard, unloading the masonry blocks from the ox-drawn wagons as they came down from the quarries. However, that evening Alsuda was herded into the general cell. Daniel and the rest crowded around him in the darkness to hear his story told in detail and to ply him with all the questions that they had not been able to shout up the staircase. He was something new in the dreary, monotonous round of captivity and heartbreaking labour. Only when the kettle of stew was brought down from the kitchens and the men hurried to their frugal dinner did Hal have a chance to speak to him alone. If you escape once before, Althuda, then there must be a chance we can do it again. I was in a better state then. I had my own fishing boat. My master trusted me, and I had the run of the colony. How can we escape from the walls that surround us? I fear it would be impossible. You use the words fear and impossible. That is not a language that I understand. I thought perhaps I had met a man, not some faint heart. Keep the harsh words for our enemies, my friend. Althuda returned his hard stare. Instead of telling me what a hero you are, tell me instead now how you receive word from the outside. Hal's stern expression cracked, and he grinned at him. He liked the man's spirit. The way he could meet broadside with broadside, he moved closer and lowered his voice as he explained to Althuda how it was done. Then he handed him the latest message he'd received. 
Alsuda took it to the grill gate and studied it in the torchlight that filtered down the staircase. Yes, he said, that is my sister's hand. I know of no other who can pen her letters so prettily. That evening the two composed a message for Abelie to collect, to let him and Sukina know that Alsuda had been released from Skellum's den. However, it seemed that Sukina already knew this, for the following day she accompanied her mistress on a visit to the castle. She rode beside Abberley on the driver's seat of the carriage. At the staircase she helped her mistress dismount. It was strange, but Hal was by now so accustomed to Katinka's visits that he no longer felt angry and bitter when he looked upon her angelic face. She held his attention barely at all, and instead he watched the slave girl. Sukina stood at the bottom of the staircase and darted quick bird-like glances in every direction as she searched for her brother's face among the gangs of convicts. Alsuda was working in the courtyard, chipping and chiselling the rough stone blocks into shape before they were swung up on the gantry to the top of the unfinished walls. His face and hair were powdered white as a miller's with the stone dust and his hands were bleeding from the abrasion of tools and rough stone. At last, Tsukina picked him out, and brother and sister stared at each other for one long, ecstatic moment. Tsukina's radiant expression was one of the most beautiful Howl had ever looked upon. But it was only for a fleeting instant. Then Tsukina hurried up the stairs after her mistress. A short time later, they reappeared at the head of the staircase. But Governor van der Felder was with them. He had his wife on his arm, and Tsukina followed them demurely. The slave girl seemed to be searching for someone other than her brother. When she mounted the driver's seat of the carriage, she murmured something to Abberley. In response, Abberley moved only his eyes, but she followed his gaze, up to the top of the scaffold, where Hal was belaying a rope end. He felt his pulse sprint as he realised that it was him she was seeking. They stared at each other solemnly, and it seemed they were very close, for afterwards Hal could remember every angle and plane of her face and the graceful curve of her neck. At last she smiled. It was a brief, honeyed interlude, then dropped her eyes. That night in his cell he lay on the clammy straw and relived the moment. Perhaps she will come again tomorrow, he thought, as sleep swept over him like a black wave. But she did not come again for many weeks. They made a place on the straw for Althuda to sleep near Hal and Daniel so that they could talk quietly in the darkness. How many of your men are in the mountains? Hal wanted to know. There are nineteen of us to begin with, but three were killed by the Dutch, and five others died after we escaped. The mountains are cruel, and there are many wild beasts. What weapons do they have? Hal asked. They have the muskets and the swords that we captured from the Dutch, but there is little powder, and by now it might all be used up. My companions have to hunt to live. Surely they have made other weapons, Hal inquired. They have fashioned bows and pikes, but they lack iron points for these weapons. How secure are your hiding places in the wilderness? Hal persisted. The mountains are endless, the gorges are a tangled labyrinth, the cliffs are harsh, and there are no paths except those made by the baboons. Do the Dutch soldiers venture into these mountains? Never. They dare not scale even the first ravine. These discussions filled all their evenings, as the winter gales came ravening down from the mountain like a pride of lions roaring at the castle walls. The men in the dungeons lay shivering on the straw pallets. Sometimes it was only the talking and the hoping that kept them from succumbing to the cold. Even so, some of the older, weaker convicts sickened. Their throats and chests filled with thick yellow phlegm, their bodies burned up with fever, and they died choking and coughing. The flesh was burned off those who survived. Although they became thin, they were hardened by the cold and the labour. Hal reached his full growth and strength in those terrible months, until he could match Daniel at belaying a rope or hefting the heavy hods. His beard grew out dense and black, and the thick pigtail of his hair hung down between his shoulder blades. The whip marks latticed his back and flanks, and his gaze was hard and relentless when he looked up at the mountain tops, blue in the distance. 
How far is it to the mountains? He asked Althuda in the darkness of the cell. Ten leagues, Althuda told him. So far, Hal whispered. How did you ever reach them over such a distance, with the Dutch in pursuit? I told you I was a fisherman, Althuda said. I went out each day to kill seals to feed the other slaves. My boat was small and we were many. It barely served to carry us across False Bay to the foot of the mountains. My sister Sukina does not swim. That is why I would not let her chance the crossing. Where is that boat now? The Dutch, who pursued us, found where we had hidden it. They burned it. Each night these councils were short-lived, for they were all being driven to the limit of their strength and endurance. But gradually, Hal was able to milk from Althuda every detail that might be of use. What is the spirit of the men you took with you to the mountains? They are brave men, and women too, for there are three girls with the band. Had they been less brave, they would never have left the safety of their captivity. But they are not warriors, except one. Who is he, this one amongst them? His name is Saba. He was a soldier until the Dutch captured him. Now he is a soldier again. Could we send word to him? Alsuda laughed bitterly. We could shout from the top of the castle walls or rattle our chains. He might hear us on his mountain top. If I had wanted a jester, I would have called on Daniel here to amuse me. His jokes would make a dog wretch, but they are funnier than yours. Answer me now, Althuda. Is there no way to reach Saba? Though his tone was light, it had an edge of steel to it, and Althuda thought a while before he replied. When I escaped, I arranged with Sukina a hiding place beyond the bitter almond hedge of the colony, where we could leave messages for each other. Saba knew of this post, for I showed it to him on the night I returned to fetch my sister. It is a long throw of the dice, but Saba may still visit it to find a message from me. I will think on these things you have told me, Hal said. And Daniel, lying near him in the dark cell, heard the power and authority in his voice and shook his head. Ah, it is the voice and the manner of Captain Frankie he has now, Daniel marvelled. What the duchies are doing to him here might have put a lesser man up on the reef, but by God, all they've done to him is filled his mainsail with a strong wind. Howell had taken over his father's role, and the crew who had survived recognised it. More and more, they looked to him for leadership, to give them courage to go on and to counsel them, to settle the petty disputes that rose almost daily between men in such bitter straits, and to keep a spark of hope and courage burning in all their hearts. The next evening, Hal took up the council of war that exhaustion had interrupted the night before. So Sukina knows where to leave a message for Saba. Naturally, she knows it well. The hollow tree on the banks of the Easter River, the first river beyond the boundary hedge, Althuda replied. Abelie must try to make contact with Saba. Is there something that is known only to you and Saba that will prove to him the message comes from you and is not a Dutch trap? Althuda thought about this. Just say, "'Tis the father of little Bobby," he suggested at last. Hal waited in silence for Althuda to explain, and after a pause he went on. Robert is my son, born in the wilderness after we had escaped from the colony. This August he will be a year old. His mother is one of the girls I spoke of. In all but name she is my wife. Nobody inside the bitter almond hedge but I could know the child's name. So you have as good a reason as any of us for wanting to fly over these walls, Hal murmured. The content of the messages that they were able to pass to Abberley was severely restricted by the size of the paper they could safely employ without alerting the jailers or the sharp, hungry scrutiny of Hugo Bernard. Howl and Althuda spent hours straining their eyes in the dim light and flogging their wits to compose the most succinct messages that would still be intelligible. The replies that returned to them were the voice of Sukina speaking, little jewels of brevity that delighted them with occasional flashes of wit and humour. Howl found himself thinking more and more of Sukina, and when she came again to the castle, following behind her mistress, her eyes went first to the scaffold where he worked before going on to seek out her brother. Occasionally, when there was space in the letters that Abberley placed in the crack of the wall, she made little personal comments, a reference to his 
bushing black beard or the passing of his birthday. This startled Howell and touched him deeply. He wondered for a while how she had known this intimate detail until he guessed that Abberley had told her. He encouraged Althuda to talk about her in the darkness. He learned little things about her childhood, her fancies and her dislikes. As he lay and listened to Althuda, he began to fall in love with her. Now, when Hal looked to the mountains in the north, they were covered by a mantle of snow that shone in the wintry sunlight. The wind came down from it like a lance and seemed to pierce his soul. Abilie has still not heard from Saba. After four months of waiting, Hal at last accepted that failure. We will have to cut him out of our plans. He is my friend, but he must have given me up, Althuda agreed. I grieve for my wife, for she also must be mourning my death. Let us move on, then, for it boots us not to wish for what is denied us, Hal said firmly. It would be easier to escape from the quarry on the mountain than from the castle itself. It seems that Sukina must have arranged for your reprieve. Perhaps in the same fashion she can have us sent to the quarry. They dispatched the message, and a week later the reply came back. Sukina was unable to influence the choice of their workplace, and she cautioned that any attempt to do so would arouse immediate suspicion. Be patient, Gondwani, she told him in a longer message than she had ever sent before. Those who love you are working for your salvation. Hal read that message a hundred times, then repeated it to himself as often. He was touched that she should also use his nickname, Gundwani. Of course, Abelie had told her that also. Those who love you. Does she mean Abelie alone, or does she use the plural intentionally? Is there another who loves me too? Does she mean me alone, or does she include Althuda, her brother? He alternated between hope and dismay. How can she trouble my mind so, when I have never even heard her voice? How can she feel anything for me, when she sees nothing but a bearded scarecrow in a beggar's rags? But then, perhaps, Abelie has been my champion, and told her I was not always thus. Plan as they would, the days passed, and hope grew threadbare. Six more of Hal's seamen died during the months of August and September. Two fell from the scaffold, one was struck down by a falling block of masonry, and two more succumbed to the cold and the damp. The sixth was Oliver, who had been Sir Francis's manservant. Early in their imprisonment, his right foot had been crushed beneath the iron-shod wheel of one of the ox-wagons that brought the stone down from the quarry. Even though Dr. Saar had placed a splint upon the shattered bone, the foot would not mend. It swelled up and burst out in suppurating ulcers that smelt like the flesh of a corpse. Hugo Bernard drove him back to work, even though he limped around the courtyard on a crude crutch. Hal and Daniel tried to shield Oliver, but if they intervened too obviously, Bernard became even more vindictive. All they could do was take as much of the work as they could on themselves and keep Oliver out of range of the overseer's whip. When the day came that Oliver was too weak to climb the ladder to the top of the south wall, Bernard sent him to work as a mason's boy, trimming and shaping the slabs of stone. In the courtyard, he was right under Barnard's eye, and twice in the same morning, Barnard laid into him with the whip. The last was a casual blow, not nearly as vicious as many that had preceded it. Oliver was a tailor by trade, and by nature a timid and gentle creature, but like a cur driven into an alley from which there was no escape, he turned and snapped. He swung the heavy wooden mallet in his right hand, and though Barnard sprang back, he was not swift enough and it caught him across one shin. It was a glancing blow that did not break bone, but it smeared the skin, and a flush of blood darkened Bernard's hose and seeped down into his shoe. Even from his perch on the scaffold, Hal could see by his expression that Oliver was appalled and terrified by what he'd done. Sir, he cried, and fell to his knees. I did not mean it. Please, sir, forgive me. He dropped the mallet, and held up both hands to his face in the attitude of prayer. Hugo Bernard staggered back, then stooped to examine his injury. He ignored Oliver's frantic pleas, and peeled back his hose to expose the long graze down his shin. 
Then, still without looking at Oliver, he limped to the hitching rail on the far side of the courtyard where his pair of black boarhounds was tethered. He held them on the leashes and pointed them at where Oliver still knelt. Get him! They hurled themselves against the leashes, baying and gaping with wide red mouths and long white fangs. Get him! Bonnard urged, and at the same time restrained them. The fury in his voice enraged the animals, and they leapt against the leashes so that Bernard was almost pulled off his feet. Please! screamed Oliver, struggling to rise, toppling back, then crawling towards where his crutch was propped against the stone wall. Bernard slipped the hounds. They bounded across the yard, and Oliver had time only to lift his hands to cover his face before they were on him. They bowled him over and sent him rolling over the cobbles, then slashed at him with snapping jaws. One went for his face but he lifted his arm and had buried its fangs in his elbow. Oliver was shirtless, and the other hound caught him in the belly. Both held on. From high on the scaffold, Howell was powerless to intervene. Gradually, Oliver's screams grew weaker and his struggles ceased. Bernard and his hounds never let up. They went on worrying the body long after the last flutter of life had been extinguished. Then Bernard gave the mutilated body one last kick and stepped back. He was panting wildly, and sweat slimed his face and dripped onto his shirt front. But he lifted his head and grinned up at Hal. He left Oliver's body lying on the cobbles until the end of the work shift, when he singled out Hal and Daniel. Throw that piece of offal on the dung heap behind the castle. He will be more use to the seagulls and crows than he ever was to me. And he chuckled with glee when he saw the murder in Hal's eyes. When spring came round again, only eight were left. Yet the eight were tempered by these hardships. Every muscle and sinew stood proud beneath the tanned and weathered skin on Howell's chest and arms. The palms of his hands were tough as leather and his fingers powerful as a blacksmith's tongs. When he broke up a fight, a single blow from one of his scarred fists could drop a big man to the paving. The first promise of spring dispersed the gale-driven clouds, and the sun had new fire in its rays. A restlessness took over from the resigned gloom that had possessed them all during the winter. Tempers were short, fighting amongst them more frequent, and their eyes looked often to the far mountains from which the snows had thawed or turned out across the blue Atlantic. Then there came a message from Abberley in Sukina's hand. Saba sends greetings to A., Bobby and his mother pined for him. It filled them all with a wild and joyous hope that in truth had no firm foundation, for Saba and his band could only help them once they had passed the bitter almond hedge. Another month passed, and the wild flame of hope that had lit their hearts sank to an ember. Spring came to its full glory and turned the mountain into a prodigy of wild flowers whose colours stunned the eye and whose perfume reached them even on the high scaffold, the wind came singing out of the southeast, and the sunbirds returned from they knew not where, setting the air afire with their sparkling plumage. Then there was a laconic message from Sukina and Abelie. It is time to go. How many are you? That night they discussed the message in whispers that shook with excitement. Abelie has a plan. But how can he get all of us away? Ah, for me, he is the only horse in the race. Big Daniel growled. I'm laying every penny I have on him. If only I had a penny to lay, Ned chuckled. It was the first time Hal had heard him laugh since Oliver had been ripped to pieces by Bernard's dogs. How many are going? Hal asked. Think on it a while, lads, before you give an answer. In the bad light, he looked around the circle of heads, whose expressions turned grim. If you stay here, you will go on living for a while at least, and no man will think the worse of you. If we go and we do not reach the mountains, then you all saw the way my father and Oliver died. T'was not a fitting death for an animal, let alone a man. Alsuda spoke first. Even if it were not for Bobby and my woman, I would go. Aye, said Daniel. Aye, said Ned. That's three, Hal murmured. What about you, William Rogers? I am with you, Sir Henry. Don't test me, Billy. I have told you not to call me that. Hal frowned. 
When they used his title, he felt himself a fraud, for he was not worthy of the honour that his grandfather had won at the right hand of Drake. The title that his father had carried with such distinction. Your last chance, Master Billy. If your tongue trips again, I'll kick some sense into the other end of you. Do you hear? I, I hear you sweet and clear, Sir Henry. Billy grinned at him, and the others roared with laughter as Hal caught him by the scruff of his neck and boxed his ears. They were all bubbling over with excitement, all that was but Dick Moss and Paul Hale. I've grown too old for a lark such as this, Sir Hal. My bones are so stiff I could not climb a pretty lad if you tied him over a barrel for me, let alone climb a mountain. Dick Moss, the old pederast, grinned. Ah, forgive me, Captain. But Paul and me have talked it over, and we'll stay on here where we'll get a belly full of stew and a bundle of straw each night. Perhaps you are wiser than the rest of us, Hal nodded, and he was not saddened by the decision. Dicky was long past his glory days, when he had been the man to beat to the masthead when they reefed sail in a full gale. This last winter had stiffened his limbs and greyed his hair. He would be non-paying cargo to carry on this voyage. Paul was Dickie's shipwife. They had been together for twenty years, and though Paul was still a fury with a cutlass in his hand, he would stay with his ageing lover. Oh, good luck to you both. You're as good a pair as I ever sailed with, Hal said, and looked at Wally Finch and Stan Sparrow. What about you two birds? Will you fly with us, lads? As high and as far as you're going, Wally spoke for both of them, and Hal clapped his shoulder. That makes six of us, eight with Abilene and Althuda, and it'll be high and far enough to suit all our tastes, I warrant you. There was a final exchange of messages as Abilene and Sukina explained the plan they had worked out. Hal suggested refinements and drew up a list of items that Abilene and Sukina must try to steal to make their existence in the wilderness more certain. Chief amongst these were a chart and compass, and a backstaff if they could find one. Abilene and Sukina made their final preparation without letting their trepidation or excitement become apparent to the rest of the household. Dark eyes were always watching everything that happened in the slave quarters, and they trusted nobody now that they were so close to the chosen day. Sukina gradually assembled those items for which Hal had asked, and added a few of her own that she knew they would need. The day before the planned escape, Sukina summoned Abilene into the main living area of the residence, where before he had never been allowed to enter. I need your strength to move the carved armoire in the banquet hall, she told him, in front of the cook and two others of the kitchen staff. Abilene followed her submissively as a trained hound on a leash. Once they were alone, Abilene dropped the demeanour of the meek slave. Be quick, Sukina warned him. The mistress will return very soon. She is with Slow John at the bottom of the garden. She moved swiftly to the shutter of the window that overlooked the lawns and saw that the ill-assorted couple was still in earnest conversation under the oak trees. There is no limit to her depravity, she whispered to herself as she watched Katinka laugh at something the executioner had said. She would make love to a pig or a poisonous snake if the fancy came upon her. Sukina shuddered at the memory of that ophidian tongue exploring the secret recesses of her own body. It will never happen again, she promised herself. Only four more days to endure before Althuda will be safe. If she calls me to her nest before then, I will plead that my courses are flowing. She heard something whirl in the air like a great bird in flight and glanced back over her shoulder to see that Abilene had taken one of the swords from the display of weapons in the hallway. He was testing its balance and temper, swinging it in singing circles around his head so that the reflections of light off the blade danced on the white walls. He set it aside and chose another, but liked it not at all and placed it back with a frown. Hurry, she called softly to him. Within minutes he had picked out three blades, not for the jewels that decorated the hilts, but for the litheness and temper of their blades. All three were curved scimitars made by the armourers of Shah Jahan at Agra, on the Indian continent. They were made for a Mughal prince, and sit ill in the hand of a rough sailor, but they will do, until I can find a cutlass of good Sheffield steel to replace them. Then he picked out a shorter blade, 
a cookery knife used by the hill people of further India, and he shaved a patch of hair off his forearm. Oh, this will do for the close work I have in mind, he grunted with satisfaction. I have marked well those you have chosen, Sukina told him. Now leave them on the rack or their empty slots will be noticed by the other house slaves. I will pass them to you on the evening before the day. That afternoon she took her basket and the conical straw hat on her head went up into the mountain. Although any watcher would not have understood her intent, she made certain that she was out of sight, hidden in the forest that filled the great ravine below the summit. There was a dead tree that she had noted on many previous outings. From the rotting pith sprouted a thicket of tiny purple toadstools. She pulled on a pair of gloves before she began to pick them. The gills beneath the parasol-shaped tops were of a pretty yellow colour. These fungi were toxic, but only if eaten in quantity would they be fatal. She had chosen them for this quality. She did not want the lives of innocent men and their families on her conscience. She placed them in the bottom of the basket and covered them with other roots and herbs before she descended the steep mountainside and walked sedately back through the vineyards to the residence. That evening, Governor van der Felder held a gala dinner in the Great Hall and invited the notables from the settlement and all the company dignitaries. These festivities continued late, and after the guests had left the household, staff and slaves were exhausted. They left Sukina to make her rounds and lock up the kitchens for the night. Once she was alone, she boiled the purple toadstools and reduced the essence to the consistency of new honey. She poured the liquid into one of the empty wine bottles from the feast. It had no odour, and she did not have to sample it to know that it had only the faintest taste of the fungi. One of the women who worked in the kitchens of the castle barracks was in her debt. Sukina's potions had saved her eldest son when he had been stricken by the smallpox. The next morning she left the bottle in a basket with remedies and potions in the carriage for Abberley to deliver to the woman. When Abberley drove the governor down to the castle, van der Felder was ashen-faced and grumpy with the effects of the previous night's debauchery. Abberley left a message in the slot in the wall that read, Eat nothing from the garrison kitchen on the last evening. That night, Hal poured the contents of the stew kettle into the latrine bucket before any of the men were tempted to sample it. The steaming aroma filled the cell, and to the starving seamen it smelled like the promise of eternal life. They groaned and gritted their teeth and cursed Hal, their fates and themselves, to see it wasted. The next morning, at the accustomed hour, the dungeon began to stir with life. Long before dawn outlined the four small barred windows, men groaned and coughed and then crept one at a time to ease themselves, grunting and farting as they voided in the latrine bucket. Then, as the significance of the day dawned upon them, a steely, charged silence gripped them. Slowly the light of day filtered down upon them from the windows, and they looked at each other askance. They had never been left this late before. On every other morning they had been at work on the walls an hour earlier than this. When at last Mancia's keys rattled in the lock, he looked pale and sickly. The two men with him were in no better case. "'What ails you, Mansir? Hal asked. "'We thought you had changed your affections and that we would never see you again.' The jailer was an honest simpleton, with little malice in him, and over the months Hal had cultivated a superficially amicable relationship with him. "'I spent the night in the shithouse,' Mansir moaned, "'and I had company, for every man in the garrison was trying to get in there with me. "'Even at this hour half of them are still in their bunks.' He broke off as his belly rumbled like distant thunder, and a desperate expression came over his face. Here I go again. I swear I'll kill that poxy cook. He started back up the stairs and left them waiting another half an hour before he returned to open the grill gate and lead them out into the courtyard. Hugo Bernard was waiting to take over from him. He was in a foul mood. We have lost half a day's work, he snarled at Mansir. Colonel Schroeder will blame me for this. When he does, I'll come back to you, Mansir. He turned on the line of convicts. Don't you bastards stand there smirking? By God, you're going to give me a full day's work even if I have to keep you on the scaffold until midnight. Now leap to it, and quickly too. Bernard was in fine fettle, his face ruddy and his temper already on the boil. It was clear that the colic and diarrhoea that afflicted the rest of the garrison had not touched him. 
Hal remembered Mancia remarking that Bernard lived with a Hottentot girl in the settlement down by the shore and did not eat in the garrison mess. He looked around quickly as he walked across the courtyard to the foot of the ladder. The sun was already well up and its rays lit the western redoubt of the castle. There were less than half the usual number of jailers and guards, one sentry instead of four at the gates, none at the entrance to the armory, and only one more at the head of the staircase that led to the company officers and the governor's suite on the south side of the courtyard. When he climbed the ladder and reached the top of the wall, he looked across the parade to the avenue and could just make out the roof of the governor's residence among the trees. Godspeed, Abberley, he whispered. We are ready for you. Abberley brought the carriage round to the front of the residence, a few minutes earlier than the governor's wife had ordered it, and pulled up the horses below the portico. Almost immediately, Sukina appeared in the doorway and called to him. Abberley! The mistress has some packages to take with us in the carriage. Her tone was light and easy, with no hint of strain. Please come and carry them down. This was for the benefit of the others whom she knew would be listening. Obediently, Abberley locked the brake on the carriage wheels, and with a quiet word to the horses, jumped down from the coachman's seat. He moved without haste, and his expression was calm as he followed Sukina into the house. He came out again a minute later, carrying a rolled-up silk rug and a set of leather saddlebags. He went to the back of the carriage and placed this luggage in the panniers, then closed the lid. There was no air of secrecy about his movements and no furtiveness to alert any of the other slaves. The two maids, who were busy sweeping the front terrace, did not even look up at him. He went back to his seat and picked up the reins, waiting with the slave's infinite patience. Katinka was late, but that was not unusual. She came at last in a cloud of French perfume and rustling silks, sweeping down the stairs and scolding Sukina for some fancied misdemeanour. Sukina glided beside her on small, silent, slippered feet, contrite and smiling. Katinka climbed up into the carriage like a queen on her way to her coronation, and imperiously ordered Sukina, Come and sit here beside me. Sukina gave her a curtsy with her hands to her lips. She had hoped that Katinka would give her that command. When she was in the mood for physical intimacy, Katinka wanted her close enough to be able to stretch out her hand and touch her. At other times she was cold and aloof, but at all times unpredictable. "'Tis an omen for good that she does what I intended,' Sukina encouraged herself, as she took the seat opposite her mistress and smiled at her lovingly. "'Drive on, Abuli, Katinka called, and then, as the carriage pulled away, gave her attention to Sukina. "'How does this collar suit me in the sunlight? Does it not make me seem pale and insipid?' "'It goes beautifully with your skin, mistress,' Sukina told her what she wanted to hear. "'Even better than it does indoors. Also it brings out the violet lights in your eyes.' "'Should there not be a touch more lace in the collar, do you think?' Katinka tilted her head prettily. Sukina considered her reply. "'Your beauty does not rely on even the finest lace from Brussels,' she told her. "'It stands alone.' "'Do you think so, Sukina? Oh, "'You are such a flatterer. "'But I must say you yourself are looking particularly fetching this morning.' "'She considered the girl thoughtfully. "'The carriage was now bowling down the avenue at a trot, "'the greys arching their necks and stepping out handsomely.' There is colour on your cheeks and the twinkle in your eye. One might be forgiven for thinking that you were in love. Sukino looked at her in a way that made Katinka's skin tingle. Oh, but I am in love with a special person, she whispered. My naughty little darling, Katinka purred. The carriage came out into the parade and turned towards the castle. Katinka was so engrossed that for some while she did not realise where they were heading. Then a shadow of annoyance crossed her face and she called sharply, Abberley, what are you doing, idiot? Not to the castle. We are going to Mafro de Val. Abberley seemed not to have heard her. The greys trotted straight on towards the castle gates. Sukina, tell the fool to turn around. Sukina stood up quickly in the swaying carriage, then sat down close beside Katinka and slipped her arm through that of her mistress, holding her firmly. 
What on earth are you doing, child? Not here. Have you lost your mind? Not in front of the whole colony. She tried to pull her arm, but Sukina held it with a strength that shocked her. We are going into the castle, Sukina said quietly, and you are to do exactly what I tell you to do. Abelie, stop the carriage this instant, Katinka raised her voice and made to stand up. But Sukina jerked her down in her seat. Don't struggle, Sukina ordered, or I will cut you. I will cut your face first so that you are no longer beautiful. Then, if you still do not obey, I will send this blade through your slimy, evil heart. Katinka looked down, and for the first time saw the blade that Sukina held to her side. That dagger had been a gift from one of Katinka's lovers, and she knew just how sharp was its slender blade. Sukina had stolen it from Katinka's closet. Are you mad? Katinka blanched with terror and tried to squirm away from the needle point. Yes, mad enough to kill you and to enjoy doing it. Sukina pressed the dagger to her side, and Katinka screamed. The horses pricked their ears. If you scream again, I will draw your blood. Sukina warned. Now hold your tongue and listen while I tell you what you are to do. I will give you to slow John and laugh as he draws out your entrails, Katinka blustered. But her voice shook and terror was in her eyes. You will never laugh again, not unless you obey me. This dagger will see to that. And she pricked Katinka again hard enough to pierce cloth and skin so that a spot of blood the size of a silver gilder appeared on her bodice. Please, Katinka whimpered. Please, Sukina, I will do as you say. Please don't hurt me again. You said you loved me. And I lied, Sukina hissed at her. I lied for my brother's sake. I hate you. You will never know the strength of my hatred. I loathe the touch of your hands. I am revolted by every filthy, evil thing you forced me to do. So do not trade on any love from me. I will crush you with as little pity as I will rid my hair of lice. Katinka saw death in her eyes, and she was as afraid as she had seldom been in her life before. I will do as you tell me, she whispered, and Sukina instructed her in a flat, hard tone that was more threatening than any shouting or raging. As Abelly drove the carriage through the castle gates, the usual stir of activity heralded its arrival. The single sentry came to attention and presented his musket. Abelly wheeled the team of greys and brought the carriage to a halt in front of the company officers. The captain of the guard hurried from the armoury, hastily strapping on his sword belt. He was a young subtleton, fresh out from Holland, and he had been taken by surprise by the unexpected arrival of the governor's wife. The devil's horns, he muttered to himself. Why does the bitch pick today to arrive when half my men are sick as dogs? He looked anxiously at the single guard at the door to the company offices and saw that the man's face still had a pale greenish tinge. Then he realised that the governor's wife was beckoning him from her seat in the carriage. He broke into a run across the courtyard, straightening his cap and tightening the strap under his chin as he went. He reached the carriage and saluted Katinka. Good morning, Mafro. May I assist you to dismount? The governor's wife had a strained, nervous look, and her voice was high and breathless. The subaltern was instantly alarmed. Is something amiss, my frau? Yes, something is very much amiss. Call my husband. Will you go to his office? No. I will remain here in the carriage. Go to him this instant and tell him that I say he must come immediately. It is a matter of the utmost importance. Life and death. Go. Hurry. The subaltern looked startled and saluted quickly, then bounded up the steps two at a time and shot through the double doors into the offices. While he was gone, the Abberley dismounted, went to the panniers at the back of the carriage and opened the lid. Then he glanced around the courtyard. There was one guard at the gates and another at the head of the stairs, but, as usual, the slow match of their muskets was unlit. There was no sentry posted at the doors of the armoury, but from where he stood he could see through the window that three men were in the guardroom. Each of the five overseers in the courtyard carried swords as well as their whips and canes. Hugo Bernard was at the far end of the yard and had both his hounds on the leash. He was haranguing the gang of common convicts, laying the paving stones along the foot of the east wall. These other convicts 
not part of the crew of the Resolution, might be a hazard when they made their attempt to escape. Nearly two hundred were working on the walls, the multi-hued dregs of humanity. They could easily hamper the rescue attempt by blocking the escape route or even by trying to join in with the Resolution's crew, mobbing the carriage when they realised what was happening. We'll deal with that when it happens, he thought grimly, and turned his full attention to the armed guards and overseers who were the primary threat. With Bernard and his gang, there were ten armed men in sight, but an outcry could bring another twenty or thirty soldiers hurrying out of the barracks and across the yard. The whole business could get out of hand quickly. He looked up to find Hal and Big Daniel watching him from the scaffold. Hal already had the rope of the gantry in his hand. The tail looped around his wrist. Ned Tyler and Billy Rogers were on the lower tier, and the two birds, Finch and Sparrow, were working near Alsuda in the courtyard. They were all pretending to carry on with their tasks, but were eyeing Abberley surreptitiously. Abberley reached into the pannier and loosened the twine that secured the rolled silk carpet. He opened a flap of it, and without lifting them clear, revealed the three mogul scimitars and the single kukri knife that he had chosen for himself. He knew that from their vantage point, Hal and Big Daniel could see into the pannier. Then he stood immobile and expressionless at the back wheel of the carriage. Suddenly the governor burst hatless, and in his shirt sleeves threw the double doors at the head of the staircase and came down at an ungainly lurching run. What is it, Mafro? he called urgently to his wife when he was halfway down. They say you sent for me, and it is a matter of life and death. Hurry, Katinka cried plaintively. I am in the most terrible predicament. He arrived at the door of the carriage, panting wildly. Tell me what ails you, Mafro, he gasped. Abberley stepped up behind him and hooked one great arm around his neck, pinning him helplessly. Van der Felder began to struggle. For all his obesity, he was a powerful man, and even Abberley had difficulty in holding him. What in the devil's name are you doing? he roared in outrage. Abberley placed the blade of the cookery at his throat. When van der Felder felt the cold touch of steel and the sting of the razor edge, his struggles ceased. I will slit your throat like the great hog you are, Abberley whispered in his ear. And Sukina has a dagger at your wife's heart. Tell your soldiers to stay where they are and throw down their arms. The subaltern had started forward at van der Felder's cry, and his sword was halfway out of its scabbard as he rushed down the stairs. Stop! van der Felder shouted at him in terror. Don't move, you fool! You will have me killed! The subaltern halted and dithered uncertainly. Abberley tightened his lock around the governor's throat. Tell him to throw down his sword. Throw down your sword! van der Felder whinnied. Do as he says! Can't you see he has a knife at my throat? The subaltern dropped his sword, which clattered down the steps. Fifty feet above the courtyard, Howell sprang out from the scaffold, hanging on the rope from the gantry, and Big Daniel belayed the other end, breaking the speed of his fall. The sheaves squealed as he plummeted down and landed in balance on the cobbles. He leapt to the rear of the carriage and seized one of the jewelled scimitars. With the next leap, he was halfway up the steps where he stooped and swept up the subaltern's sword in his left hand. He placed the point under the officer's chin and said, Order your men to throw down their weapons. Lay down your arms, all of you, the subaltern yelled. If any man amongst you brings harm to the governor or his lady, he will pay for it with his own life. The sentries obeyed with alacrity, dropping their muskets and sidearms to the paving stones. You too, van der Felder howled at the overseers, and with reluctance they obeyed. However, at that moment, Hugo Bernard was screened by a pile of masonry blocks. He stepped quietly into the doorway to the kitchens, dragging his two hounds with him, and crouched there, waiting for his opportunity. Down from the scaffold scrambled the other seamen. Sparrow and Finch from the lower tier were first to reach the courtyard, but Ned, Big Daniel and Billy Rogers were seconds behind them. Come on, Althuda, Hal called, and Althuda dropped his mallet and chisel and ran to join him. Catch! Hal lobbed the jewelled scimitar in a high, glinting parabola, and Althuda reached up and caught it by the hilt, plucking it neatly out of the air. Hal wondered what class of swordsman he was. As a fisherman, it was unlikely that he would have had much practice. I shall have to shield him if it comes to a fight, he thought, and looked around quickly. 
He saw Daniel pulling the other weapons out of the pannier at the back of the carriage. The twin scimitars looked like toys in his huge fist. He tossed one to Ned Tyler and kept the other for himself as he ran to join Hal. Hal picked up a sword that a sentry had dropped and threw it to Big Daniel. This one's more your style, Master Danny, he yelled, and Daniel grinned, showing his broken black teeth as he caught the heavy infantry weapon and made it hiss in the air as he cut left and right. Sweet Jesus, it's good to have a real blade in my hand again, he exulted, and tossed the light scimitar to Wally Finch. A tool for a man, but a toy for a boy. Abberley, keep a firm hold on that great hog. Cut his ears off if he tries to be crafty, Hal shouted. The rest of you, follow me. He dropped down the staircase and raced towards the doors of the armory, with Big Daniel and the others on his heels. Alsuda began to follow him also, but Hal stopped him. No, not you. You look after Sukina. As Alsuda turned back and they ran on across the courtyard, Hal snapped at Daniel. Where's Bernard? Oh, the murdering bastard were here not a moment past, but I don't see him now. Keep a good look out for his topsails. We'll have trouble with that swine yet. Hal burst into the armory. The three men in the guardroom were slumped on the bench. Two were asleep, and the third scrambled to his feet in bewilderment. Before he could recover his wits, Hal's point was pressed to his chest. Stay where you are, or I'll look at the colour of your liver. The man dropped back into his seat. Here, Ned, Hal called to him as Ned rushed in. Play wet nurse to these infants and left them in his charge as he ran after Daniel and the other seamen. Daniel charged the heavy teak door at the end of the passage, and it burst open before his rush. They had never before had a chance to look into the armoury, but now, at a glance, Hal saw that it was all laid out in a neat and orderly fashion. The weapons were in racks along the walls, and the powder kegs stacked to the ceiling at the far end. "'Pick your weapons and bring a keg of powder each,' he ordered and they ran to the long racks of infantry swords, polished, gleaming, and sharpened to a bright edge. Further back were the racks of muskets and pistols. Hal thrust a pair of pistols into the rope that served him as a belt. Remember, you will have to carry everything you take with you up the mountain, so don't be greedy, he warned them, and picked up a fifty-pound keg of gunpowder from the pyramid at the far end of the armory, which he hoisted to his shoulder. Then he turned for the door. That's enough, lads. Get out. Daniel, lay a powder trail as you go. Daniel used the butt of a musket to stove in the bungs of two of the powder kegs. At the foot of the pyramid of barrels, he poured a mound of black gunpowder. Oh, that lot will go off with an almighty bang, he grinned as he backed towards the door, the other keg under his arm spilling a long, dark trail behind him. Under their burdens, they staggered out into the sunlight. Hal was the last to leave. Get out of here, Ned, he ordered, and handed him the weapons he carried as Ned ran for the door. Then Hal turned on the three Dutch soldiers, who were cowering on the bench. Ned had disarmed them. Their weapons were thrown in the corner of the guardroom. I'm going to blow this place to hell, he told them in Dutch. Run for the gates, and if you're wise, you'll keep running without looking back. Go! They sprang up, and in their haste to get clear, jammed in the doorway. They struggled and fought each other until they burst out into the courtyard and raced across it. Look out! they yelled as they sprinted for the gates. They're going to blow up the powder store! The jailers and the other common convicts, who until this point had stood gaping at the carriage and the hostage governor in Abberley's grip, now turned their heads towards the armory and stared at it in stupid surprise. Howell appeared in the armory doorway with a sword in one hand and a burning torch that he had seized from its bracket in the other. I am counting to ten! Howell shouted, and then I am lighting the powder train. In his rags, and with his great bushy black beard and wild eyes, he looked like a maniac. A moan of horror and fear went up from every man in the yard. One of the convicts threw down his spade and followed the fleeing soldiers in a rush for the gate. Immediately pandemonium overwhelmed them all. Two hundred convicts and soldiers stormed the gates in a rush for safety. Von der Felder struggled in Abberley's grip and screamed, Let me go! The idiot is going to blow us all to perdition! Let me go! Run! Run! His shrieks added to the panic, and within the time it takes to draw and hold a long breath, the courtyard was deserted except for the group of seamen around the carriage and Hal. Katinka was screaming and sobbing hysterically, but Sukina slapped her hard across the face. 
Keep quiet, you simpering ninny, or I'll give you a good reason to blubber. And Katinka gulped back her distress. Abberley, get van der Felder into the carriage. He and his wife are coming with us, Hal called, and Abberley lifted the governor bodily and hurled him over the top of the door. He landed in an ungainly heap on the floorboards and struggled there like an insect on a pin. Alsuda, put your sword point to his heart and be ready to kill him when I give the word. I will look forward to it, Althuda shouted, dragged by van der Felder upright, and then thrust him into the seat facing his wife. Where should I give it to you, he asked, in your fat gut, perhaps? Van der Felder had lost his wig in the scuffle, and his expression was abject, every inch of his huge frame seeming to quiver with despair. Don't kill me. I can protect you, he pleaded, and Katinka started weeping and keening again. This time Sukina merely held her a little tighter, lifted the point of the dagger to her throat and whispered, We don't need you now, we have the governor. It won't matter at all if I kill you. Katinka choked back the next sob. Daniel, load the powder and the spare weapons, Hal ordered, and they piled them into the carriage. The elegant vehicle was no wagon, and the coachwork sagged under the load on its delicately sprung suspension. That's enough. It will take no more, Abberley stopped them, throwing the last few powder kegs on board. One man to each horse, Hal commanded. Don't try to board them, lads. You're none of you riders. You'll fall off and break your necks, which won't matter much, but your weight will kill the poor beasts before we've gone a mile, and that will matter. Lay hold of their rigging and let them tow you along. They ran to their places around the team of horses and latched onto their harness. Leave space for me on the larboard bow, lads, he called. And even in her excitement and agitation, Sukina laughed aloud at his use of the nautical terms. His men understood, though, and left the offside lead horse for him. Abberley leapt to his place on the coachman's seat, while in the body of the carriage Althuda menaced van der Felder and Sukina held her dagger to Katinka's white throat. Abberley wheeled the team and shouted, Come on, Gunduani! It is time to go. The garrison will wake up at any moment now. As he said it, they heard the flat report of a pistol shot, and a garrison officer ran from the doorway of the barracks across the square, waving his smoking pistol, shouting to his men to form up on him. Stand to arms! On me, the first company! Hal paused only a moment to light the slow match of one of his pistols from the burning torch, then tossed the torch onto the powder train and waited to see it flare and catch. The smoking flame started snaking back through the doors of the armory into the passageway that led to the main powder magazine. Then he sprang down the steps into the courtyard and raced to meet the overloaded carriage as Abberley drove the horses in a circle and lined up for the gates. He was almost there, raising his hand to seize the bridle of the leading grey gelding when suddenly Abberley shouted in agitation, Guntuani! Behind you! Have a care! Hugo Bernard had appeared in the doorway, where he and his hounds had taken shelter at the first sign of trouble. Now he slipped both dogs from the leash, and with wild yells of encouragement sent them in pursuit of Hal. Fotum! Catch him! he yelled, and the animals raced towards him in a silent rush, running side by side, striding out and covering the length of the courtyard like a pair of whippets coursing a hare. Abberley's warning had given Hal just time enough to turn to face them. The dogs worked as a team, and one leapt for his face while the other rushed for his legs. Hal lunged at the first while it was in the air, and sent his point into the base of the black throat where it joined the shoulders. The flying weight of the hound's body drove the blade in full length, transfixing it cleanly through heart and lung onto its guts. Even though it was dead, the momentum of its flight drove it to crash into Hal's chest, and he staggered backwards. The second hound snaked in low to the ground, and while Hal was still off balance, sank its fangs into his left shin just below the knee, jerking him over backwards. His shoulder crashed into the stone paving, but when he reached to rise, the animal still had him in its grip and pulled back on all four braced legs, sending him sprawling again. Hal felt its teeth grate on the bone of his leg. My hounds! Bernard yelled. You are hurting my darlings! 
With his drawn sword in his hand, he rushed to intervene. Again, Hal tried to rise, and again the hound pulled him down. Bernard reached them and raised his sword to his full height above Hal's unprotected head. Hal saw the blow coming and rolled aside. The blade struck the flint cobbles beside his ear in a sheet of sparks. You bastard! Bernard roared and lifted the sword again. Abberley swerved the team of horses and drove them deliberately at Bernard. The overseer's back was turned to the approaching carriage, and he was so engrossed with Hal that he did not see it coming. As he was about to strike again at Hal's head, the rear wheel caught him a glancing blow on the hip and sent him staggering aside. With a violent effort, Hal hauled himself into a sitting position, and before the hound could drag him flat again, he stabbed it in the base of the neck, driving his blade at an angle back between its shoulder blades, like the bullfighter's coop finding the heart. The beast let out an agonised howl and released its grip on his leg, staggered around in a circle and then collapsed on the cobbles, kicking feebly. Howl heaved himself to his feet just as Bernard rushed at him. You have killed my beauties! He was maddened with grief and hacked again at Howl, a wild, uncontrolled blow. Howl turned it effortlessly aside and let it fly an inch past his head. You filthy pirate! I will cut you down! Bernard gathered himself and rushed in again. With the same apparent ease, Hal deflected the next thrust and said softly, Do you remember what you and your dogs did to Oliver? He fainted high left, forcing Bernard to open his guard in the midline, and then, like a bolt of lightning, thrust home. The blade took Bernard just under the sternum and sprang half its length out of his back. He dropped his sword and fell to his knees. The debt to Oliver is paid, Hal said, placed his bare foot on Bernard's chest, and against its resistance pulled his blade clear. Bernard toppled and lay beside the carcass of his dying hound. Come on, Gunduani! Abberley was struggling to hold the team of greys, for the shouting and the smell of blood had panicked them. The magazine! It was only seconds since Hal had lighted the powder train, but when he glanced in that direction, he saw clouds of acrid blue smoke billowing from the doorway of the armory. Hurry, Gunduani, Sukina called softly. Oh, please, hurry. Her voice was so filled with concern for his safety that it spurred him. Even in these dire straits, Hal realised that it was the first time he had ever heard her speak his nickname. He started forward. The dog had bitten deeply into his leg, but its fangs could not have severed nerves or sinews, for Hal found that if he ignored the pain, he could still run on it. He leapt across the yard and grabbed hold of the leading horse's bridle. It tossed its head and rolled its eyes until the pink lining showed, but Hal hung on, and Abberley gave the team its head. The carriage went rocking and clattering under the archway of the gates, across the bridge, over the moat and out onto the open parade. Suddenly, from behind them, came a shattering explosion, and a shock wave of disrupted air swept over them like a tropical line squall. The horses reared and plunged in terror, and Hal was lifted off his feet. He clung desperately to the traces and looked back. A tower of dun-coloured smoke rose swiftly from the interior courtyard of the castle, spinning and revolving upon itself, shot through with dark flames and scraps of debris and wreckage. In the midst of this plume of destruction, a single human body cartwheeled one hundred feet into the sky. For Sir Hal and King Charlie, Big Daniel roared, and the other seamen took up the cheering, beside themselves with excitement at their escape. However, when Hal looked back again, he could see that the massive outer walls of the castle were untouched by the detonation. The barracks had been built of the same heavy stonework and almost certainly had withstood the blast. Two hundred men were housed in there, three companies of green jackets, and even now they were probably recovering their wits after the explosion. Soon they would come pouring out through the castle gates in full pursuit. And where, he wondered, was Colonel Cornelius Schroeder? The carriage was pounding across the parade at a gallop. Ahead ran a mob of escaped convicts. They were scattering in every direction, some leaping over the stone wall of the company gardens and heading for the mountain, others running for the beach to find a boat in which to make good their flight. 
Out on the parade, where the few stunned burghers and house slaves who were abroad at this time of the forenoon, they gawked in amazement at the tide of fugitives, then at the rolling cloud of smoke that enveloped the castle, and then at the even more extraordinary sight of the advancing governor's carriage, festooned with a motley array of desperate tatterdemalion outlaws and pirates, screaming like madmen and brandishing their weapons. As the vehicle bore down on them, they scattered frantically. The pirates have escaped from the castle. Run, run. At last they recovered and spread the alarm. The cry was taken up and shouted ahead of them through the huts and hovels of the settlement. Howell could see the burghers and their slaves hurrying to escape the bloodthirsty pirate crew. One or two of the braver souls had armed themselves, and there was a desultory popping of musket fire from some of the cottage windows. But the range was long, the aim hurried and poor. Howell did not even hear the flight of the balls, and none of the men or horses were hit. The carriage swept on past the first buildings, following the only road that skirted the curving beach of Table Bay, and headed out into the unknown. Hal looked back at Abberley. Slow down, damn you! You'll blow the horses before we've got past the town! Abberley stood upright and pulled the horses back. Whoa, Royal! Slow down, Cloud! But the team were bolting and had almost reached the outskirts of the settlement before Abberley was able to wrestle them to a trot. They were all sweating and snorting from the gallop, but were far from spent. As soon as they were under control, Hal loosed his grip on the harness and turned back to jog beside the carriage. Althuda, he called. Instead of sitting up there like a gentleman on a Sunday picnic, make sure all the muskets are primed and loaded. Here. He passed up the pistol with the burning match. Use this to light the match on all the weapons. They'll be after us soon enough. Then he looked from Althuda to his sister. We've not been introduced. Your servant, Henry Courtney. He grinned at her, and she laughed delightedly at his formal manner. Good morrow, Gunduani. I know you well. Abelie has warned me of what a fierce young pirate you are. Then she turned serious. You are hurt. I should see to your leg. "'Tis nothing that cannot wait until later,' he assured her. "'The bite of a dog will mortify swiftly if it is left untreated,' she told him. "'Later,' he repeated, and turned to Abberley. "'Abberley, are you acquainted with the road to the boundary of the colony?' "'There is only one road, Gondwani. "'We have to go straight through the village, skirt the marshland, "'and then head out across the sandy flatlands towards the mountains,' he pointed. "'The bitter almond fence is five miles beyond the marsh.' Looking beyond the settlement, Hal could already see marshland and lagoon ahead, stands of reeds and open water, over which hovered flocks of water birds. He had heard that crocodiles and hippopotami lurked in the depths of the lagoon. Alsuda, will there be any soldiers in our way? Hal asked him. There are usually guards at the first bridge, and there is always a patrol at the bitter almond hedge to shoot any hottentots who try to enter, Alsuda replied without looking up from the musket he was loading. Then Sukina sang out, There will be no pickets or patrols today. From dawn I kept a watch on the crossroad. No soldiers went out to take up their posts. They are all too busy nursing their aching bellies. She laughed gaily, as excited and wrought up as the rest of them. Suddenly she leapt up in the body of the carriage and called out in a ringing voice, Free! For the first time in my life I am free! Her plait had tumbled down and come loose. Her hair streamed out behind her head. Her eyes sparkled, and she was so beautiful that she epitomized the dreams of every one of the ragged seamen. Although they cheered her, You and us also, darling! It was Howell at whom she was looking with those laughing eyes. As they passed the buildings of the settlement, the warning cries had been shouted ahead of them. Beware! The pirates have escaped! The pirates are on the rampage! The good citizens of Good Hope scattered before them. Mothers rushed into the street to seize their offspring and drag them indoors, to throw the door bolts and slam down the shutters. You are safe now. You have escaped clean away. Please, will you not let me free, Sir Henry? Katinka had recovered from her shock sufficiently to plead for her life. I swear I have never meant you harm. I saved you from the gallows. I saved Althuda also. I will do anything you say, Sir Henry. 
Just please set me free. She whimpered, clinging to the side of the carriage. You may call me sir now, and make me those declarations of goodwill, but they would have stood my father in better stead while he was on his way to the gallows. Owl's expression was so cold and remorseless that Katinka recoiled and fell back in the seat beside Tsukina, sobbing as though her heart were breaking. The seamen running with Howl shouted their scorn and hatred at her. You wanted to see us hanged, you painted doxy, and we're going to feed you to the lions out there in the wilderness, gloated Billy Rogers. Katinka sobbed afresh and covered her face with her hands. I never meant any of you harm. Please let me go. The carriage rolled steadily down the empty street, and the last few huts and hovels of the settlement were all that lay ahead when Arthuda rose from his seat and pointed back down the gravel-surfaced road towards the distant parade. Horsemen coming up to the gallop, he cried. So soon, Big Daniel muttered, shading his eyes. I had not expected the pursuit yet. Do they have cavalry to send after us? Have no fear of that, lads, Abelie reassured them. There are no more than twenty horses in the whole colony, and we have six of those. Abelie is right. Tis only one horseman, shouted Wally Finch. The rider was leaving a pale ribbon of dust in the air behind him, leaning forward over his mount's neck as he drove the animal to its top speed, using the whip in his right hand to flog it onwards mercilessly. He was still far off, but Hal recognised him from the sash that flowed out behind him with the speed of his gallop. Sweet Mary, it's Schroeder. I knew he would join us before too long. His jaw clenched in anticipation. The hot-headed idiot comes alone to fight us. Brains he lacks, but he has a full cargo of guts. Even from his seat, Aberley could see what Howell intended by the narrowing of his eyes and the way he changed his grip on his sword. Don't think of going back to give him satisfaction, Gunduani, Aberley called sternly. You will place every soul here at risk for any delay. I know you think I'm no match for Schroeder, but things have changed, Aberley. I can beat him now. I'm sure of it in my heart. Aberley thought that he might well do so, for Howell was no longer a boy. The months on the walls had toughened him, and Aberley had seen him match strength with Big Daniel. Leave me here to see to this business, man to man, and I will follow you later, Hal cried. No, Sir Hal, shouted Big Daniel. Maybe you could best him, but not with that leg bitten to the bone. Leave your feud with the Dutchman for another time. We need you with us. There will be a hundred green jackets following close behind him. No, agreed Wally and Stan. You stay with us, Captain. We put our trust in you, said Ned Tyler. We can never find our way through the wilderness without a navigator. You can't desert us now. Hal hesitated, still glaring back at the swiftly approaching rider. Then his eyes flicked to the face of the girl in the carriage. Sukina stared at him, her huge dark eyes full of entreaty. You are sorely wounded. Look at your leg. She leaned over the door of the carriage, so that she was very close, and spoke so softly that he could only just make out the words above the din of men and wheels and horses. Stay with us, Gundwani. He glanced down at the blood and pale lymph oozing from the deep puncture wounds. While he wavered, Big Daniel ran back and jumped up onto the step of the carriage. Oh, you take care of this one, he said, and lifted the loaded musket from Althuda's hands. Holding it, he dropped from the step into the dirt of the road and stood there checking the burning matchlock and the priming in the pan. He took his time as the carriage trotted away from him, and Colonel Schroeder galloped down on him. Despite all their pleas and warnings, Howell started back to intervene. Daniel, don't kill the fool! He wanted to explain that he and Schroeder had a destiny to work out together. It was a matter of chivalric honour, in which no other should come between them. But there was no time to give voice to such a romantic notion. Schroeder galloped to within earshot and stood in his stirrups, Katinka, he shouted, have no fear, I come to save you, my darling. I will never let these villains take you. He plucked the bell-muzzled pistol from his sash and held the matchlock in the wind so that the smouldering match flared. Then he lay flat along his horse's neck with his pistol arm outstretched. Out of my way, oaf, he roared at Daniel and fired. His right arm was thrown high by the discharge, 
and a wreath of blue smoke swirled around his head. But the ball flew wide, hitting the earth a foot from Daniel's bare right leg, showering him with gravel. Schroeder threw aside the pistol and drew the Neptune sword from its scabbard at his side. The gold inlay on the blade glinted as he wielded it. I'll cleave your skull to the teeth, Schroeder roared and raised the blade high. Daniel dropped on one knee and let the colonel's horse come on the last few strides. Too close, Hal thought, much too close. If the musket misfires, Danny is a dead man. But Daniel held his aim steadily and snapped the lock. For an instant, Hal thought his worst fear had been realised, but then, with a sharp retort, a spurt of flame and silver smoke, the musket discharged. Perhaps Daniel had heeded Hal's shout, or perhaps the horse was a bigger and surer target than the rider upon its back, but he had aimed into the animal's wide, sweat-drenched chest, and the heavy lead ball for once flew true. At full charge, Schroeder's steed collapsed under him. He was thrown over its head, slamming face and shoulder into the ground. The horse struggled and kicked, lying on its back, thrashing its head from side to side, while its heart blood pumped from the wound in its chest. Then its head fell back to earth with a thump, and with one last snorting breath, it lay still. Schroeder lay motionless on the sun-baked road, and Hal felt a moment's fear that his neck was broken. He almost ran back to aid him, but Schroeder made a few disjointed movements, and Hal paused. The carriage was drawing away swiftly, and the others were shouting to him, Come back, Gunduani! Leave the bastard, Sir Henry! Daniel sprang up, grabbed Hal's arm. He ain't dead, but we soon will be if we lie becalmed here much longer, and dragged him away. For the first few steps, Hal resisted and tried to shake off Daniel's hand. It can't end like this. Don't you understand, Danny? I understand well enough, Big Daniel grunted. And at that, Schroeder sat up groggily in the middle of the road. The gravel had torn the skin off one side of his face, but he was trying to get to his feet, lurching and falling, and then trying again. He's all right, said Hal, with a relief that almost surprised him, and allowed Daniel to pull him away. Aye said Daniel, as they caught up with the carriage. He's right enough to crop your acorns for you when you next meet. We'll not be rid of that one so easily. Abberley braked the carriage to allow them to catch up, and Hal grabbed the bridle of the leading horse and allowed it to lift him off his feet. He looked back to see Schroeder on his feet in the middle of the road, dusty and bleeding. He staggered after the carriage like a man with a bottle of cheap gin in his belly, still brandishing the sword. They pulled away from him at a brisk trot, and Schroeder gave up the attempt to overhaul the departing carriage, instead screamed abuse after it. By God! Henry Courtney! I am coming after you, even if I have to follow you to the very gates of hell. I have you in my eye, sir. I have you in my heart. When you come, bring with you that sword you stole from me, Hal shouted back. I'll spit you with it like a sucking pig for the devil to roast. His seamen hooted with laughter and gave the colonel an assortment of obscene farewell gestures. Katinker, my darling, Schroeder changed his tone. Do not despair. I will rescue you. I swear it on my father's grave. I love you with my very life. Throughout all the shouting and the musket fire, Van der Velder had been crouching on the floor of the carriage, but now he heaved himself back onto the seat and glared at the battered figure in the road. Is he raving mad? How dare he address my wife in such odious terms? He rounded on Katinka with a red face and wobbling jowls. Mefro, I trust you have given the dolt of a soldier no cause for such license? I assure you, Menier, his language and address come as more of a shock to me than they do to you. I take great offence, and I implore you uh, to take him seriously to task at the first opportunity, replied Katinka, clinging to the door of the carriage with one hand and to her bonnet with the other. I will do better than that, Mefro. He will be on the next ship back to Amsterdam. I cannot abide with such impertinence. Moreover, he is responsible for the predicament we are now in. As commander of the castle, the prisoners are his responsibility. Their escape is due to his incompetence and the dereliction of his duty. 
The dastard has no right to speak to you in such a fashion. Oh, yes, he does, said Sukina sweetly. Colonel Schroeder has the right of conquest in his favour. Your wife has been lying under him often enough with her legs in the air for him to call her darling, or even to call her whore and slut, if he chose to be more honest. Quiet, Sukina, shrilled Katinka. Are you out of your mind? Remember your place. You are a slave. No, Mifro. A slave no longer. A free woman now, and your captor, Sukina told her. So I can say to you anything I please, especially if it is the truth. She turned to van der Felder. Your wife and the gallant colonel have been playing the beast with two backs so blatantly as to delight every tattletale in the colony. They have set a pair of horns on your head that are too large for even your grossly bloated body. I will have you thrashed, van der Felder gurgled apoplectically. You slave bitch. No, you won't, said Althuda, and placed the point of the jewelled scimitar against the governor's pendulous belly. Rather, you will apologise for that insult to my sister. Apologise to a slave? Huh! Never, van der Felder began in a bellow. But this time, Althuda pricked him with more intent, and the bellow turned into a squeal, like air escaping from a pig's bladder. Apologise not to a slave, but to a free-born Balinese princess, Althuda corrected him, and swiftly. I beg your pardon, madam, van der Felder gritted through clenched teeth. You are gallant, sir, Sukina smiled at him. Van der Felder sank back in his seat and said no more, but he fixed his wife with a venomous stare. Once they had left the settlement behind them, the surface of the road deteriorated. There were deep wheel ruts left by the company wagons going out to fetch firewood, and the carriage rocked and lurched dangerously through them. Along the edge of the lagoon, the water had seeped in to turn the tracks to mud and slush, and in many places the seamen were forced to put their shoulders to the tall rear wheels to help the horses drag the vehicle through. It was late morning before they saw ahead the framework of the wooden bridge over the first river. Soldiers, Abberley called. From his high seat he had picked out the glint of bayonet and the shape of the tall helmets. Only four, said Hal. His eyes were still the sharpest of all. They'll not be expecting trouble from this direction. He was right. The corporal of the bridge guard came forward to meet them, puzzled but unalarmed, his sword sheathed and the match on his pistols unlit. Hal and his crew disarmed him and his men, stripped them to their breeches and sent them running back towards the colony with a discharge of muskets over their heads. While Abberley walked the carriage over the bridge and took it on along the rudimentary track, Hal and Ned Tyler climbed beneath the wooden structure and roped a barrel of gunpowder under the heavy timber kingpost. When it was secure, Hal used the butt of his pistol to drive in the bung of the barrel, thrust a short length of slow match into it and lit it. He and Ned scrambled back onto the roadway and ran after the carriage. Hal's leg was painful now. It was swelling and stiffening. But he was looking back over his shoulder as he hobbled along through the ankle-deep sand. The centre of the bridge suddenly erupted in a spout of mud, water, shattered planks and piers. The wreckage fell back into the river. That'll not hold the good colonel long. But at least he will get his breeches wet, Hal muttered as they caught up with the carriage. Althuda jumped down and called to him. Take my place. You must favour that leg. There's little wrong with my leg, Hal protested. Other than it can barely carry your weight, said Sukina sternly, leaning over the door. Come up here at once, Kunduani, or else you will do lasting damage to it. Meekly, Hal climbed up into the coach, and took the seat opposite Sukina. Without looking at the pair, Abberley grinned to himself. Already she gives the orders and he obeys. It seems they have the tide and a fair wind behind them. Let me look at that leg, Sukina ordered, and Hal placed it on the seat between her and Katinka. Take care, you clod, Katinka snapped, and pulled away her skirts. You will bloody my dress. If you do not have a care to your tongue, it will not be the only thing I will bloody, Hal assured her, and scowled. 
she withdrew into the furthest corner of the seat. Sukina worked over the leg with swift, competent hands. I should lay a hot poultice on these bites, for they are deep and will certainly fester, but I need boiling water. She looked up at Hal. You have to wait for that until we reach the mountains, he told her. Then, for a while, their conversation broke down, and they gazed into each other's eyes bemusedly. This was as close as they had ever been, and each found something in the other to amaze and delight them. Then Sukina roused herself. I have my medicines in the saddlebag, she said briskly, and climbed over the seat to reach the panniers on the back of the carriage. She hung there as she rummaged in the leather bags. The carriage jolted on over the rough track, and Hal looked with awe on her small rounded bottom pointed skywards. Despite the ruffles and petticoats that shrouded it, he thought it almost as enchanting as her face. She climbed back with cloths and a black bottle in her hand. I will swab out the wounds with this tincture and then bind them up, she explained without looking again into the distraction of his green eyes. Avast! Hal gasped at the first touch of the tincture. That burns like the devil's breath. Sukina scolded. You have endured whip and shot and sword and savaging by an animal, but the first touch of medicine and you cry like a baby. Now be still. Abelie's face creased into a bouquet of tattoos and merry laughter lines, but though his shoulders shook, he held his peace. Hal sensed his amusement and rounded on him. How far ahead is the bitter almond hedge? Another league. Will Saba meet us there? That is what I believe. If the green jackets don't catch up with us first. Methinks we will have some respite. Schroeder made an error by rushing alone in pursuit of us. He should have mustered his troops and come after us in an orderly fashion. My guess is that most of the green jackets will be chasing the other prisoners we turned free. They'll concentrate on us only once Schroeder takes command. And he has no horse, Sukina added. I think we will get clear away, and once we reach the mountains... She broke off and lifted her eyes from Hal's leg. Both she and Hal looked ahead to the high blue rampart that filled the sky ahead. Van der Felder had been avidly following this conversation, and now he broke in. The slave wench is right. You have succeeded in this underhand scheme of yours, more's de pity. However, I am a reasonable man, Henry Courtney. Set my wife and me free now. Give the carriage over to us, and let us return to the colony. In exchange, I will give you my solemn undertaking to call off the chase. I will order Colonel Schroeder to send his men back to their barracks. He turned on Hal what he hoped was an open and guileless countenance. I offer you my word as a gentleman on it. Hal saw the cunning and malice in the governor's eyes. Your Excellency, I am uncertain of the validity of your claim to the title of gentleman, besides which I should hate to be deprived so soon of your charming company. At that moment, one of the front wheels of the carriage crashed into a hole in the tracks. The aardvarks dig these burrows, Althuda explained as Hal clambered down from the lopsided vehicle. Pray, what manner of man or beast is that? The earth pig, a beast with a long snout and a thick tail that digs up the burrows of ants with its powerful claws and devours them with its long, sticky tongue, Althuda told him. Hal threw back his head and laughed. Ha! Of course I believe that. I also believe that your earth pig flies, dances the hornpipe and tells fortunes by cards. You have a few things yet to learn about the land that lies out there, my friend, Alsuda promised him. Still chuckling, Hal turned from him. Come on, lads, he called to his seamen. Let's get the ship off the reef and running before the wind again. He made Van der Felder and Katinka get out, and the rest of them strained with the horses to pull the carriage free. From here onwards, though, the track became barely passable, and the bush on either hand grew taller and more dense as they went on. Within the next mile, they were stuck in holes twice more. It's almost time to get rid of the carriage. We can get on faster on our own shanks, Hal told Abberley quietly. How much further to the hedge? I thought we should have reached it by now, Abberley replied. But it cannot be far. They came to the boundary around the next kink in the narrow track. 
The famous bitter almond hedge was a straggly and blighted excrescence, hardly shoulder high, but the road ended dramatically against it. There was also a rough hut, which served as a guard post to the border picket and a notice in Dutch. Warning, the notice began, in vivid scarlet letters, and went on to forbid movement by any person beyond that point, with the penalty for infringement being imprisonment or the payment of a fine of a thousand guilders or both. The board had been erected in the name of the governor of the Dutch East India Company. Howell kicked open the door of the single room of the guard hut and found it deserted. The fire on the open hearth was cold and dead. A few articles of company uniform hung on the wooden pegs in the wall, and a black kettle stood over the dead coals with odd bowls, bottles and utensils lying on the rough wooden table or on shelves along the walls. Big Daniel was about to put the slow match to the thatch, but Hal stopped him. No point in giving Schroeder a smoke beacon to follow, he said. And there's naught of value here, leave it be. And limped back to where the seamen were unloading the carriage. Abberley was turning the horses out of the traces, and Ned Tyler was helping him to improvise pack saddles for them, using the harness, leatherwork and canvas canopy from the carriage. Katinka stood forlornly at her husband's side. What is to become of me, Sir Henry? she whispered as he came up. Some of the men want to take you up into the mountains and feed you to the wild animals, he replied. Her hand flew to her lips, and she paled. Others want to cut your throat here and now for what you and your fat toad of a husband did to us. You would never allow such a thing to happen, van der Felder blustered. I only did what was my duty. You're right, Hal agreed. I think throat cutting too good for you. I favour hanging and drawing as you did to my father. He glared at him coldly, and van der Felder quailed. However, I find myself sickened by you both. I want no further truck with either of you and so I leave you and your lovely wife to the mercy of God the devil and the amorous Colonel Schroeder. He turned and strode away to where Abberley and Ned were checking and tightening the loads on the horses. Three of the greys had kegs of gunpowder slung on each side of their backs. Two carried bundles of weapons, and the sixth horse was loaded with Sukina's bulky saddlebags. All shipshape, Captain, Ned knuckled his forehead. We can up anchor and get under way at your command. There's nothing to keep us here. The Princess Sukina will ride on the lead horse. He looked around for her. Where is she? I am here, Gunduani. Sukina stepped out from behind the guard hut. And I need no molly coddling. I will walk like the rest of you. Hal saw that she had shed her long skirts and that she now wore a pair of baggy Balinese breeches and a loose cotton shift that reached to her knees. She had tied a cotton headcloth over her hair and on her feet were sturdy leather sandals that would be comfortable for walking. The men ogled the shape of her calves in the breeches, but she ignored their rude stares, took the lead rein of the nearest horse and led it towards the gap in the bitter almond hedge. Sukina! Hal would have stopped her, but she recognised his censorious tone and ignored it. He realised the folly of persisting and wisely tempered his next command. Alsuda, you are the only one who knows the path from here. Go ahead with your sister. Alsuda ran to catch up with her, and brother and sister led them into the uncharted wilderness beyond the hedge. Hal and Abberley brought up the rear of the column as it wound through the dense scrub and bush. No men had trodden this path recently. It had been made by wild animals. The marks of their hoofs and paws were plain to see in the soft sandy soil, and their dung littered the track. Abberley could recognise each animal by these signs, and as they moved along at a forced pace, he pointed them out to Hal. That is a leopard, and there is the spore of the antelope, with the twisted horns we call kudu. At least we shall not starve, he promised. There is great plenty of game in this land. This was the first opportunity since the escape that they had had to talk, and Hal asked quietly, This Saba, this friend of Alsuda, what do you know of him? Only the messages he sent. Should he not have met us at the hedge? He said only that he would lead us into the mountains. I expected him to be waiting at the hedge. Abberley shrugged. 
But with Althuda to guide us, we do not need him. They made good progress, the grey mare trotting easily with them, hanging onto her traces and running beside her. Whenever they passed a tree that would bear Abberley's weight, he shinned up it and looked back for signs of pursuit. Each time he came down and shook his head. Schroeder will come, Hal told him. I have heard men say that those green jackets of his can run down a mounted man. They will come. They moved on steadily across the plain, stopping only at the swampy waterholes they passed. Hal hung on to the horse to ease his injured leg, and as he limped along, Abberley recounted all that had happened in the months since they had last been together. Hal was silent as he described in his own language how he had retrieved Sir Francis's body from the gibbet and the funeral he had given him. It was the burial of a great chief. I dressed him in the hide of a black bull and placed his ship and his weapons within his reach. I left food and water for his journey, and before his eyes I set the cross of his god. Hal's throat was too choked for him to thank Abberley for what he had done. The day wore on, and their progress slowed as men and horses tired in the soft sandy footing. At the next marshy swamp where they stopped for a few minutes' rest, Hal took Sukina aside. You have been strong and brave, but your legs are not as long as ours, and I have watched you stumble with fatigue. From now on you must ride. When she started to protest, he stopped her firmly. I obeyed you in the matters of my wounds, but in all else I am captain, and you must do as I say. From here on you will ride. Her eyes twinkled. She made a pretty little gesture of submission, placing her fingertips together and touching them to her lips. As you command, master and allowed him to boost her up on top of the saddlebags on the leading grey. They skirted the swamp and went on a little faster now. Twice more Abberley climbed a tree to look back and saw no sign of pursuit. Against his natural instincts, Hal began to hope that they might have eluded their pursuers, that they might reach the mountains that loomed ever closer and taller without being further molested. In the middle of the afternoon they crossed a broad open flay, a meadow of short green grass where herds of wild antelope with scimitar-curved horns were grazing. They looked up at the approach of the caravan of horses and men, standing frozen in wide-eyed astonishment, their coats a metallic blue-grey hue in the afternoon sunlight. Even I have never seen beasts of that ilk, Abberley admitted. As the herds fled before them, wreathed in their own dust, Althuda called back, those are the animals the Dutch call Blaubok, the blue buck. I have seen great herds of them on the plains beyond the mountains. Beyond the flay, the ground began to rise in a series of undulating ridges towards the foothills of the range. They climbed towards the first ridge, with Hal toiling along at the rear of the column. By now he was moving heavily, in obvious pain. Abberley saw that his face was flushed with fever, and that blood and watery fluid had seeped through the bandage that Sukina had placed on his leg. At the top of the ridge, Abberley forced a halt. They looked back at the great table mountain, which dominated the western horizon. To their left, the wide blue curve of False Bay opened. However, they were all too exhausted to spend long admiring their surroundings. The horses stood, heads hanging, and the men threw themselves down in any shade they could find. Sukina slid off her mount and hurried to where Hal had slumped with his back to a small tree trunk. She knelt in front of him, unwrapped the bandage from his leg, and drew a sharp breath when she saw how swollen and inflamed it was. She leaned closer and sniffed the oozing punctures. When she spoke, her voice was stern. You cannot walk further on this. You must ride as you force me to do. Then she looked up at Abberley. Make a fire to boil water, she ordered him. We have no time for such tomfoolery, Hal murmured half-heartedly. But they ignored him. Abberley lit a small fire with a slow match and placed over it a tin mug of water. As soon as it boiled, Sukina prepared a paste with the herbs she had in her saddlebag and spread it on a folded cloth. While it still steamed with heat, she clapped the cloth over Hal's wounds. He moaned and said, oh, I, I swear I'd rather Abberley pissed on my leg 
than you burnt it off with your devilish concoctions. Sukina ignored his immodest language and went on with her task. She bound the poultice in place with a fresh cloth. Then, from her saddlebags, she fetched a loaf of bread and a dried sausage. She cut these into slices, folded bread and sausage together, and handed one to each of the men. Ah, bless you, princess, Big Daniel knuckled his forehead before taking his ration from her. God love you, princess, said Ned, and all the others adopted the name. From then on she was their princess, and the rough seamen looked upon her with increasing respect and burgeoning affection. You can eat on the march, lads, Hal hauled himself to his feet. We've been lucky too long. Soon the devil will want his turn. They groaned and muttered, but followed his lead. As Hal was helping Sukina to mount, there was a warning shout from Daniel. There are the bastards come at last, he pointed back down at the open flay at the bottom of the slope. Hal pushed Sukina up between the saddlebags and limped back to the rear of the column. He looked down the hillside and saw the long file of running men who had emerged from the edge of the scrub and were crossing the open ground. They were led by a single horseman who came on at a trot. It's Schroeder again. He's found another mount. Even at that range, there was no mistaking the colonel. He sat tall and arrogant in the saddle, and there was a sense of deadly purpose about the set of his shoulders and the way he lifted his head to look up the slope towards them. It was obvious that he had not yet spotted them, hidden in the thick scrub. How many men with him? Ned Tyler asked and they all looked at Hal to count them. He slitted his eyes and watched them come out of the thick scrub. With their swinging trot, they kept up easily with Schroeder's horse. Twenty, Hal counted. Why so few? Big Daniel demanded. Almost certainly, Schroeder has chosen his fastest runners to press us hard. The rest will be following at their best speed. Hal shaded his eyes. Yes, by God, there they are, a league behind the first platoon. But coming fast, I can see their dust and the shape of their helmets above the scrub. There must be a hundred or more in the second detachment. Uh, Twenty we can deal with, Big Daniel muttered. But a hundred of those murdering greenbacks is more than I can eat for breakfast without belching. What orders, Captain? Every man looked at Hal. He paused before replying, carefully studying the lie and the grain of the land below, before he said... Master Daniel, take the rest of the party on with Althuda to guide you. Abilie and I will stay here with one horse to slow down their advance. We cannot outrun them. They proved that to us, Captain, Daniel protested. Would it not be better to fight them here? You have your orders, Hal turned a cold, steely eye upon him. Daniel again knuckled his brow. Aye, aye, Captain, and he turned to the others. You heard the orders, lads. Hal limped back to where Sukina sat on her horse, with Althuda holding the lead rein. You must go on, whatever happens. Do not turn back for any reason, he told Althuda, and then he smiled up at Sukina. Not even if Her Royal Highness commands it. She did not return his smile, but leaned down closer and whispered, I will wait for you on the mountain. Do not make me wait too long. Althuda led the column of horses forward again. And as they crossed the skyline, there was a distant shout from the flay below. So, they have discovered us, Abilie muttered. Hal went to the single remaining horse and loosened one of the fifty-pound kegs of gunpowder. He lowered it to the ground and told Abilie, Take the horse on, follow the others, let Schroeder see you go. Tether it out of sight beyond the ridge and then come back to me. He rolled the keg to the nearest outcrop of rock and crouched beside it. With only the top of his head showing, he again studied the slope below him, then turned his full attention to Schroeder and his band of green jackets. Already they were much closer, and he could see that two of the Hottentots ran ahead of Schroeder's horse. They watched the ground as they came on, following exactly the route that Hal's party had blazed. They read our sign from the earth, like hounds after the stag, he thought. They will come up the same path we followed. At that moment, Abberley dropped back over the ridge and squatted beside him. The horses tethered and the others go apace. Now what is your plan, Gunduani? It is so simple, there is no need to explain it to you, said Hal. 
as he prized the bung from the keg with the point of his sword. Then he unwound the length of the slow match he had tied around his waist. This match is the devil. It either burns too fast or too slow. But I will take a chance on three fingers' length, he muttered as he measured, then lopped off a length. He rolled it gently between the palms of his hands in an attempt to induce it to burn evenly, then threaded one end into the bunghole of the keg and secured it by driving back the wooden plug. You had best hurry, Gundwani. Your old fencing partner, Schroeder, is in great haste to meet you again. Hal glanced up from his task and saw that the pursuers had crossed the meadow and were already starting up the slope towards them. Keep out of sight, Hal told him. I want to let them get very close. The two lay flat on their bellies and peered down the hillside. Sitting high in the saddle, Schroeder was in full view, but the two trackers who led him were obscured by the scrub and flowering bushes from the waist down. As they came on, Hal could make out the ugly gravel greys down Schroeder's face, the rents and dirt smears on his uniform. He wore neither hat nor wig, had probably lost them along the way, perhaps in his fall. Vain though he was, he had wasted no time in trying to regain them, so urgent was his haste. The sun had already reddened his shaven pate, and his horse was lathered. Perhaps he had not bothered to water it during the long chase. Closer still he came. His eyes were fastened on the ridge where he had seen the fugitives cross. His face was a stony mask, and Hal could see that he was a man driven by his volcanic temper, ready to take any risk or brave any danger. On the steep slope, even his indefatigable trackers began to flag. Hal could see the sweat streaming down their flat yellow Asiatic faces and hear their gasping breath. Come on, you rogues, Schroeder goaded them. You will let them get clear away. Faster, run faster. They came scrambling and straining up the slope. Good, Hal muttered. They are sticking in our tracks, as I hoped. He whispered his final instructions to Abelie. But wait until I give you the word, he cautioned him. Closer they came, until Hal could hear the Hottentot's bare feet slapping the ground, the squeak of Schroeder's tack and the jingle of his spurs. On he came, until Hal saw the individual beads of sweat that decorated the points of his moustache and the little veins in his bulging blue eyes as he fixed his obsessed and furious stare on the skyline of the ridge, overlooking the enemy who lay hidden much closer at hand. Ready, whispered Hal, and held the burning slow match to the fuse of the powder keg. It flared, spluttered, caught, then burned up fiercely. The flame raced down the short length of fuse towards the bunghole. Now, Abelie, he snapped. Abelie seized the keg and leapt to his feet. Almost under the hooves of Schroeder's horse, the two Hottentots yelled with shock and ducked off the path, while the horse shied and reared, throwing Schroeder forward onto its neck. For a moment Abelie stood poised, holding the keg high above his head with both hands. The fuse sizzled and hissed like an angry puff adder, and the powder smoke blew around his great tattooed head like a blue nimbus. Then he hurled the keg out over the hillside. It turned lazily in the air before striking the rocky ground and bounding away, bouncing and leaping as it gathered speed. It jumped up into the face of Schroeder's horse, which reared away just as its rider had recovered his balance. Schroeder was thrown forward again onto its neck, lost one of his stirrups, and hung awkwardly out of the saddle. The saddle. The saddle. The saddle.